Episode 466, The Beginning of a Counterattack, 2. Guo. Powerful poison mutants rose up through the ground. Each one of them is a monster with a huge and hideous body. And a man at the forefront of the reinforcements took out a dark red knife and was cutting the poison mutants into pieces as if they were rotten radishes. Puff puff puff. Osiris, the head of the Iron Blood Sword family, stood tall over the corpses of the poisoners, who were collapsing with a fountain of blood. Eat a lot, nephew. Osiris swept away even the evil spirits of the Red Death and turned his head to the side. There stood a girl with black hair and red eyes. Your uncle. Sam Chun, not uncle. Uncle. I'm sad. Why don't you call me Sam Chun? But before Osiris could finish speaking, Pomerian stretched out his hands forward. Tsutsutsutsu. The wraith tree grew. Dark red ghosts rise above the corpses of dead Germans as if they were being pulled out. Skeleton-shaped fruits were growing profusely on the bare branches. The battlefield is the best place for the revenant tree to grow. At that time. Kaya. From behind Pomerian, one of the surviving poisoners came running, his body in complete disrepair. He was such a cunning guy that he was lying on the floor like a corpse holding his breath. The moment the guy stretched out his long arm and tried to grab Pomerian. Puff puff. Three slashes chopped off the poisoner's arm. Fluttering. Three black blood-like strands were blocking Pomerian's path. High bro, middle bro, low bro. They muttered as they looked up at the mountain peaks beyond the corpses of the Germans. Let's go. My lord is waiting. My lord is waiting. You are waiting. The trident of the Baskervilles, or rather, the trident of Vakir. They were escorting Pomerian and at the same time leading the knights and rushing towards the summit. Of course, the road to the mountain peak was long and difficult. Countless German mutants are flocking in and running rampant like demons, so not even decent knights can easily break through the siege wall. That was the case until the seven counts of the House of Baskerville stepped forward. Six shadows stretched across the battlefield, which was entirely covered with dark red aurora. Six counts, excluding the Cane Corso's position that had remained vacant for a long time, appeared on the mountain of corpses. Boston Terrier, Les Baskerville, leader of the Pitbull Knights. Les Baskerville, the Great Dane, leader of the Mastiff Knights. Isabella, La Baskerville, leader of the Doberman Knights. German, Les Baskerville, leader of the Shepherd Knights. Les Baskerville, Metzgerhund, leader of the Rottweiler Knights. C.U. Chulin, Les Baskerville, leader of the Wolfhound Knights. Having spent their entire lives on the battlefield, they quickly adapted to the war against German mutants. Puff 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 puff. The Boston Terrier struck down a long slash and beheaded a huge number of poisonous soldiers. Waves of blood were crashing on the ground and showers of blood were falling from the sky. He he he. I probably caught the most on this battlefield. However. Bang. With an ear-piercing explosion, a poisonous mutant with a huge body collapsed. The Great Dane, who had punched a hole in the demon's huge head, walked out, wiping the blood from his knife with the hem of his clothes. What do I do if I catch a lot? Gotta catch the big one. Maybe what I caught is the biggest on this battlefield. Gibberish. It's best to catch a lot. Are anglers competing based on what they catch? Even if you catch just one, it's best to catch the big one. Right then. Chiak. A black slash was drawn between the Boston Terrier and the Great Dane who were bickering. One of the poison mutants was cut in half and fell down, and Isabella walked out in front of it. The path she walked was completely stained with blood. At first glance, it looks like it killed a lot more dogs than the Boston Terrier. Among the mountains of corpses, there were often larger bodies than those killed by Great Danes. If you have time to fool around, can you cut down one more fish? The Boston Terrier and Great Dane groaned and avoided eye contact. Whether I fought with that young, smart woman with swords or words, I always lost. In addition, other counts were also pushing forward, almost crushing the Germans. German, who fiercely breaks through the barrier as if he can't lose to Isabella, Metzgerhund, 
who spreads his six teeth as if to prove that he is the best of the six types, and Kukulin, a four-type master who unusually insists only on the four types. They show off their individuality and violence and tear up the German siege without hesitation. The knights following behind were also running through the middle of the battlefield, following their respective leaders. Soon, the senators of the Baskerville family also appeared on the front line. Old men with pale eyebrows and long beards wear black iron armor and chop the Germans to death. He he he, Thad and Orca are on the battlefield, so shouldn't we be in the back room? Those friends must have aged a lot too. Why don't we see each other again after such a long time? Hal hal hal, it reminds me of the old days. Once upon a time, they were guys I almost encountered on the battlefield on a random day. Anyway, the situation must be serious enough that the matriarch dragged us out, right? I was tired of being treated as a waste of the previous generation, so let's loosen the reins and run wild. Okay. I guess the head of the house will take care of everything. The entire force of the Baskervilles moves. In addition, the morgue, Quo Vadis, and Bourgeois were also leading numerous troops and running through the battlefield. Les Payne, the head of the morgue, and Adolf, the representative, participated in the war in person. Pope Nobukov I of Quo Vadis, Cardinal Luther, and Archbishop Mosgus also entered the battlefield. Bourgeois also poured all of the family's wealth into this battlefield, and even the head of the family, Damien himself, was at the forefront of the war. Advance to the water source area. Let's break through Tochka. Don't stop. Keep running. The reinforcements were heading towards Tochka according to what was decided at the previous Alliance family meeting. It was the result of the persuasion of Serco, who had stormed into the conference hall with the elites of the Nouvelle Vague in the past. Quack 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 quack. All the evil spirits of the Red Death were burned to death by the flame magic unleashed by the sorcerer Adolf. Next to them, three sisters, High Sis, Middle Sis, and Low Sis, were wandering around looking for Camus. Camus. Where are you? We are working really hard. There's nothing left to say after the war is over. Of course, other than the four families' allied forces, other forces were also included in the reinforcements. Varangian Training Center, Magic Tower, Themyscira Women's College, and even Colossio Academy. Faculty members, led by Principal Banshee, also appeared on the battlefield. Ha ha ha. Finally, an old grudge is resolved. Humph, they look like dirty German bastards. Vikir. I'm coming oh. Young talents such as Bakaraga, Hohenheim, and Lovegood were also leading the student army and advancing. Even. Pass. What's this? If I had made a mistake, I would have been late. At this fun feast. Tachka's counterattack force led by Saad also arrived at the mountain peak. A large army consisting of Orca and new vague guards, prisoners, and refugee vigilantes was mercilessly trampling on the Germans. Young master. We're here too. President. Where are you in now? No, why me too? Chihuahua, Minpin, and Thindi Wendy are also seen being included in the reinforcements. Are you here to see me? Ah. What are you doing? Everyone else is watching. The sight of Osiris suddenly flying in like a strange bird and embracing Zindi Wendy with a happy smile was a sight that shocked everyone. And there was a view looking down on all of this from the mountain peak. Vikir. And Floros. The demon hunter and this city stood in a sharp confrontation with each other. And behind Vikir, Camus, Ayan, Dolores, Sinclair, and Serco stood together. Flash. The eighth Baskerville ceremony, the black sun rose high in the sky. Surrounding it were scorching flames, iron skewers, powerful rain of arrows, divine protection, golden giants, and blood-sucking snakes. It's over. Vikir continued speaking with confidence. The devil kills. However, Floros, facing Vikir's declaration, still did not lose his composure. Well. Is that so? Vikir narrowed his eyes. Floros jumped back and soon stood on the ledge of the crater. That was the place where Vikir launched a slash to clear the waterway before the battle began. Floros looked into the deep furrow and smiled. I came this far, but there is no water, so what happens? 
Aren't you very disappointed, friends? Does not matter. If only I could kill you here. Um no. Still, there has to be water, right? When I think of the refugees in Tachka. Floros, who continued to sneer, soon waved his hand towards the dark sky. And he held out his tightly clenched fist in front of Vakir. Do you know what's in here? Bakir did not enjoy talking to the devil, and he was not curious about what was inside that fist. However, before Floros could hear Bakir's answer, he opened his fist wide. What was inside was a nymph. As Bakir opened his eyes wide, Floros chewed the trembling nymph in one bite and swallowed it. And then he smiled heartily and opened his mouth. Actually, there is water. Whopping. Floros raised the spear he was holding high. And he said one last thing. I shouldn't have dug a little deeper. Moment. There was a feeling passing through Vakir's mind. It was just a feeling of disappointment. Lying Leopard. That is the nickname of Floros this time. It is Floros' habit and ability to tell plausible lies about everything. Vakir hesitated. This is because he could not predict what Floros was aiming for. And as Vakir expected, Floros revealed something he had been hiding. Quack. The devil's spear struck the bottom of the crater. Then something surprising happened. Gurgling gurgling. This is because a huge amount of water spurted out from the point where Floros spear was inserted. Minipin's information was correct. There really was a water source in the crater. However, Camus, Ian, Dolores, Sinclair, and Serco, who saw the water gushing out, could not help but look puzzled. What? Why are you suddenly visiting Suwon? It's suspicious. For some reason, they are handing over drinking water. In this situation, you even voluntarily provide water. I have a bad feeling about something. This was because I could not guess the intention of why the devil was obediently opening the waterway. And in this situation, Vikir was the only one whose expression changed suddenly. Episode 467, The Beginning of a Counterattack, 3. The only one whose expression changed suddenly was Vikir. This is because Vikir saw through all of Floro's malice at the very moment the water burst out. Lying Leopard. That is the nickname of Floro's this time. It is Floro's habit and ability to tell plausible lies about everything. He had the ability to make others believe the lies he told, and was adept at deceiving others with various tricks. Puff. The embankment collapsed and the underground water inside burst out. Gurgling gurgling. A huge amount of water is gushing out toward the ground. The water of the underground lake sleeping beneath the surface was clear and clean enough for nymphs to live in. So, the fact that there was no water in the water source area was a false proposition made by Floros. The problem was that Floros' solo spear was stuck where the water stream begins. Shririk. Two snakes opened their mouths against the stream of water. The wave that passed by the sharp fangs instantly turned red. Yes. As soon as Floros opened the waterway, he was releasing a huge amount of plague poison into the water. It was the same method used to encroach on the Usher family mansion. Ha! Huh. It's water. There really was water here. Oh my god. I thought I was going to die of thirst. But the color of the water is a bit strange. It's groundwater. Maybe there was some dirt mixed in. The soldiers were delighted when they saw the water flowing down the slope. Then, I put my mouth to the light red water and drank it down. The response came immediately. Big. Those who drank or touched the water began vomiting and having seizures. Ah. He's German. You turned into a German. Don't drink the water. Quickly call the priests. Because the priests quickly granted protection, the soldiers did not turn into Germans. However, the damage that consumed a huge amount of divine power could not be helped. Don't drink the water. Spread it backwards. You should never drink water. Don't even touch me. The soldiers spread the message to their comrades below. However, the speed at which the water flowed down was much faster than the speed at which the message spread. Also, among the soldiers in the rear, there were many who objected to the admonition not to drink the water. What? Leaders, 
Why are you telling me not to drink water? I don't know. Are they going to monopolize everything among themselves? This much water. Rather, wouldn't it be because if you drink something, you get diarrhea or something like that? Ha ha ha, if that's the case, that's okay. I have a strong stomach, so I'm fine. There was great confusion in the rear units. Those who turn into poison, those who are lying around in pain, and priests who are wasting a lot of their sacred power treating such people. Floros, who was watching all of this, burst into laughter. Ha 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 ha. How about a demon hunter? Isn't it spectacular? Floros infused even stronger magical energy into the hand holding the spear. The water began to turn a dark blood color. Poisonous Ouroboros was producing a huge amount of poison at this very moment. The reason Floros was able to spread the Red Death across the entire continent and create an enormous number of poisonous soldiers was probably thanks to the unique abilities of that spear, which was no different from its alter ego. Cheek. Vikir drew up Madame's poisonous blood and burned away all the plague poison penetrating her body. It takes at least Madame's poison to suppress the Red Death. However, it was impossible to block all the Red Death dissolved in such a huge amount of water. Everyone in the Death Squad began to realize the seriousness of the situation. The stream of water that bursts out from the source area will surely flow down the mountainside and reach Tachka Fortress. Refugees suffering from starvation due to insufficient drinking water will definitely drink this water in a hurry, and the result will be. I told you, right? He said he would turn all Tachka's trash into Germans. I always keep what I say. Floros distorted his face and laughed. The rough waves going down the mountain valley were already dyed red. If this continues, even the relief forces coming towards the water source here will all be swept away by the current and become poisoned. And the refugees remaining in Tachka will also drink this water, clutching their burning necks without knowing anything, and turning into Germans. Vikir gritted his teeth in the face of this terrifying fact. I shouldn't have come to the Suwan area. It was never allowed to come out of Tachka. Even if I had to die of thirst, I had to lock myself inside the castle walls and hold out. In the end, as a result of falling for Floro's trick, everyone ended up becoming a poisoner. Vikir quickly looked away. Dolores was there, nodding with a determined expression. You can't give up until the very end. Miracles only come to those who act. Dolores put her hands together and unleashed all her remaining divine power. Fa. The white pillar of light she created purified the surrounding waves. But it's not enough. It is impossible to purify all of this huge waterway with Dolores alone. Ugh. Dolores' expression frowned. Sweat was pouring down like rain and my body felt like it would collapse at any moment. Right then. Chin. There was a hand on her shoulder. Vikir. The night hound was leaning on both of Dolores' shoulders, giving her strength. Sorry. Now I have a place to lean on. Dolores' heart began to beat violently when she saw Vikir lowering his head as if he had no respect for her. What she had always wanted happened. She will probably never forget this moment in her life when the scarred hound, who never depended on others, laid its head on her shoulder for the first time. I can't disappoint Vikir. Dolores' eyes changed. Miracles will only be caught by those who reach out first. For those who believe and act, the answer will surely arise. Dolores knocks on the door of limitation while reciting a prayer. The resonance of the soul occurs, and a pillar of white light that is purest and purest is emitted. And all the priests of the Quo Vadis family, who saw the divine light emitted by her, also began to purify the waves with all their might. Pot. Martin Luther unfolded an enormous divine shield and washed away the entire wave. The elite priests of the Quo Vadis family, including Mosgus, also followed Dolores' lead and fiercely faced the red current. Surprisingly, the color of the bursting waves became clear for an instant. The red energy was slowly escaping. However. Ha 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 are you guys stupid? Floros was standing on top of a rock and laughing at the priests who were trying to purify the water. Holy power is not infinite, so how long do you think you can block the poison? It would be more efficient to save that power and use it to escape. What the devil said was reasonable. An enormous amount of eagle water flows down the mountain peak. 
even if we could hold out for a while, the situation was practically over. Soon the red wave of death will hit the reinforcements. And furthermore, the countless refugees who flocked to Tochka. It seemed obvious that the whole world would be filled with Germans infected with the Red Death. However. Quack. Vikir was not giving up yet as he produced eight teeth towards Floros. It's a futile effort, demon hunter. Soon it will become a German world down there. No matter how hard you try, your world is now destroyed him. However, the will that radiated from Vikir's eyes was to shut Floro's mouth. Surely your poison is strong. It far exceeded my expectations. But at most your poison has only defeated me, not the world. After finishing speaking, Bakir burst out a terrifying light from his eyes. Do not look down on this world. Bakir moved forward with all his might, breaking free from the ground he had been living on up until now. Hold your entire body weight on your big toe and run until the tip of your forehead comes forward. Black Sun Eight slashes swirled around violently, tearing Floro's torso apart. Quack. However, Floro smiled leisurely even as he watched the blood fountain gushing out of his body. Ha 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 ha, so what does this mean? The humans down there are already finished. Moment. Floro's expression, distorted with ridicule, hardened. I can see the peaks coming into view, and a stream of water flowing down the peaks in the shape of several curved, staircases. The color of the waterfall falling below the first peak is red. The color of the waterfall falling below the second peak is also red. But? The color of the waterfall falling below the third peak was strange. Transparent color. Clear waves. For some reason, the waves falling below did not carry the red energy of death at all. Huh. Why is there water in the area we missed? Who, who purified that place? The priests who were purifying the water were also embarrassed. The soldiers at the bottom of the mountainside drink the flowing water and tilt their heads. What? Why did you tell me not to drink water? Hmm. Are you okay? It's so clear and cool. Oh. Didn't the guys who went up first lie so they could drink all the water? There are so many. It was just as the soldiers said. The water that began to flow down the mountain peak was clear and transparent even though it had not been touched by divine power. The waves were flowing quickly towards Fortress Tachka in the distance. Uh, what happened? Floros craned his neck with a dumbfounded expression. Then the scenery below the mountainside finally came into view. Gulp, 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 gulp. There, a huge spider the size of dozens of adult men was drinking water, standing against the current. A spider that buries its head in the waves and sucks in a huge amount of water. I can see a red death with a radius of several tens of meters centered on that spider, drawing a vortex towards me and being sucked in. For a moment. Where have you seen a lot of spiders? No way. If it's a poison-eating spider. Oh my god. That guy. Are spiders on the ground really that big? The spider's performance was so great that Camus, Ian, Dolores, Sinclair, and Serco each said something. Vikir's expression brightened. Baby madam. The guy who broke up a long time ago has appeared with a much larger size and stronger poison. However, Floros's momentum was not yet dead. What can a spider do? It's pretty big for a spider, but that's it. At most, it's just one spider. Floro shouts nervously. It was an attitude of firm belief that the atmosphere of the battlefield could not be overturned by the appearance of just one spider. However. Pajik. That firm attitude was breaking down as the landscape beyond the land of the spiders began to become more and more visible. Thud. One more spider appeared. It was an entity as large as the original one. The spider that crawled next to the original giant spider also began to suck in water and absorb the red death. Thud. And next to it, a large spider appeared again. Thud. 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 Also. And again. Spiders keep appearing. The number has already exceeded what can be counted. 
Even the spiders that continued to appear were much larger and heavier than those that first appeared. At that time. What Thindy Wendy said a while ago came to Vakir's mind. Ah, I remembered Balak it seems a new guardian deity has appeared there these days. They say he's quite a reliable friend. Dot. Balak's new guardian deity. A reliable friend. Now that I think about it, is it already time for it to get dark like this? The night that had fallen around us was unusually dark. But when I looked up, the sun was still hanging at the end of the sky. So why is this place particularly dark? Floros raised his head. There I saw something huge, almost blocking the sky. At first glance, it was so large that one might have mistakenly thought it was the night sky. SSS. The leaves in the nearby floodplain are moving all at once. It was casting an even denser darkness on the mountain peak. Extremely. Slowly. Anything. Without a sound. When did we end up here? So much so that I don't even know it's coming. Secretly. But with a clear purpose. Episode 468, The Beginning of a Counterattack, 4. Miracles will definitely happen to those who believe and act. Dolores covered her mouth with both hands and muttered in a low voice. Anyone who saw what was happening in front of their eyes could say that, even if they were not members of the Rune Church. A bunch of giant spiders, and one spider that was by far the biggest of them all. Time has passed so quickly that the baby madam, who was once as small as a lump of dust, has now become a mother with a huge body. A huge mother with a bunch of small, children who look exactly like her. I can't believe it. It's much bigger than Madame Eight Legs. The cub was so huge that even Camus and Ian, who had seen the mother before, could not hide their surprise. It almost felt like a mountain was moving. Gurgling. A wall of spiders blocks the stream of water polluted by the Red Death. A spider monster from the world. For those who live on poison as their staple food, the Red Death was like a rich meal they had not seen in a long time. The power, size, and gluttony of the spiders, which even demons were reluctant to confront, blocked even the seemingly unstoppable wave of Red Death. Gulp, gulp, gulp. The streams of water that the spiders touch become clear and transparent again. The energies of Red Death were all being eliminated by countless spiders. Priests on one side and spiders on the other blocked the Red Death. Flubber was also eating up all the poisonous people he could find, growing in size and at the same time inhaling more and more of the Red Death. Camus and Ayen said, putting their arms around the shoulders of Dolores who was next to them. Hey, holy water vending machine. I heard you and my boyfriend were in a good mood earlier. What should I do now that I'm sad that I have less work to do? Ah, that's a shame. And who's the vending machine? It is blasphemy. And why is Vakir your boyfriend in the first place? Oh, I also benefited from this saintly juice a long time ago. Ha 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 dash. Z juice. Behind him, Sinclair was barely holding back his laughter, and Serco was just standing alone with a sullen expression. At that time. Madam Baby bowed her head in front of everyone. Coo 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 coo. The baby madam slowly lowered her face to where Vakir was standing. The sound of the carapace rubbing against the carapace surrounding the joint was transmitted like an earthquake through the ground. It's a bit strange to see it become a full-fledged adult without even seeing it. Vakir also looked at madam baby with a slightly wary attitude. However. Banks it. Madam baby lowered her head in front of Vakir and smiled brightly. Back when he was in the dormitory at Colosio Academy, he would wait alone in his room while Vakir went out to take classes, and he always had that look on his face when Vakir opened the door and came back. Nuclear nuclear nuclear. Madam Baby rubbed her head towards Vakir. An intense hug that seems completely oblivious to his increased size. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. You've grown a lot. Really a lot. Jiangun. When Vakir strokes him, he wags his tail and snuggles into my arms like in the past. Even though he has grown in size, he is still still a kid. At that time, familiar voices were heard above Madam Baby's head. Hunter. Brother. I'm here to help. How could I forget this voice? 
where Vikir looks up, he can see the faces of those he met in the flood. Ahul, whom I met at Naraksu, and the Hun, whom I had not known was alive or dead, were looking at Vikir with a bow in hand. Behind him, Balak's warriors, who were thought to be dead, can all be seen smiling at Vikir, revealing their white teeth. Crumbling. A loud noise erupted from behind Vikir, who was just about to wave his hand. Bakira, who had become Ion's phantom, was roaring towards the sky. Then, a roaring response was heard from where Balak's warriors were gathered. A wolf that looked exactly like Bakira stuck out its head. Viola becomes a Hyle's partner. Bakira's daughter. Wolf father and daughter also reunite after a long time. Yet. Puff. Puck. Probillion. The fearsome archery skills displayed by Balak's warriors began to push the Germans back. In particular, Ahio's performance was almost unrivaled. Based on the stats obtained from the Naraksu, she was overwhelming even the power of many of Balak's senior warriors. You've improved a lot, Aho. Hunting chief. Ayan roughly strokes Ahio's head. As soon as Aho saw Ayan's face, her eyes filled with tears. Meanwhile, Bikir asked the Hun, who had landed on his side. What about the chief? He was attacked by a devil in the shape of a horse. It was because of the aftereffects he suffered from the battle with Adonai. Yet he broke off the tip of its horn. After hearing Ahun's words, Bakir nodded quietly. Perhaps the reason he was able to defeat Amdugia's right after coming out of the Maw Tree was because of Akila's previous battle. Amdugia's was also unable to overcome the aftereffects of Akila. At that time, there was a hand tapping Bakir's shoulder. Kirko. She said, her eyes shining. Now is your chance. It's time to counterattack. Vikir also nodded in agreement. Soon, all the reinforcements began to push towards the mountain peak. Capture the head of the Leviathan family. The Baskervilles, the Morgue, the Quo Vadis, the Bourgeois, the Tachka reinforcements, and even Balak and the Spiders. Floros became a target for everyone gathered here. Her. Floros laughs as if it is absurd. But the situation was clearly tilted. Even the poison release, which was their secret weapon, was destroyed by the priests of the Quo Vadis family in the spiders of the Sea of Water, making the situation quite difficult for the devil. Moreover, the warriors of Baskerville and the Morgue were tearing the Germans apart with terrifying force even at this very moment, so there was a risk that the battle would end in an instant if the battle continued like this. Floros looked back at Vikir and smiled. Okay. I admit it. I guess I saw your world too easily. A declaration of defeat came from the devil's mouth. However, Bakir knew better than anyone else that victory was not a victory unless the enemy's life was clearly put to an end. This is especially true when dealing with demons. Bang! At the same time that Bakir kicked off the ground and ran away, Floros also leaned back. You have to catch it here. Floros is a strong and cunning being. This is true of all demons, but among them, Floros was a being with a much higher risk. Bikir ran up the mountain peak with the determination to kill himself. The Germans tried to block, but the cover of the five men following Bikir was blowing away the obstacles and opening the way. Camus, Yen, Dolores, Sinclair, Serco. Scorching flames, iron skewers, powerful rain of arrows, divine protection, golden giants, and blood-sucking snakes shattered the wall of poisoners trying to protect Floros from Vikir with overwhelming force. And Vikir broke through the collapsing wall of Germans and caught Floros behind him. The devil is. Black sun. Eight fierce teeth are revealed. Kill. The hunting dog had a strong murderous intent. Right then. Oh, my son. Floros suddenly turned his face over. A black shadow shimmered in front of Floros, who had pulled back his leopard skin and revealed the facial skin of Hobbes, the head of the Leviathan family. At the same time. Cough. Vikir had to lift Beelzebub to block the heavy scythe falling on the top of his head. Fluttering. A tattered black long gun flutters about after numerous melees. Harvester. He was blocking Vikir's path, spewing out thick poisonous fog. Quagajik. The sword and scythe collide, creating countless sparks. 
but the harvester was no match for Vakir. The more teeth there were, and the more dizzy the sword strike, the more the harvester was being pushed away by Vakir mercilessly. Some poisons don't work on me. After speaking, Bakir removed the scythe with his sword and at the same time struck the reaper's chest with his palm. Ugh! The sound of the clavicle being broken open came from the harvester's chest. But Floros didn't care at all. Hold on just a little longer, son. The movement magic circle will be activated soon. The line was uttered more to mock Bakir than to encourage the reaper. Floros removed Hob's face again and sneered at Bakir. Now, write that. After hearing Floro's command, the harvester immediately took out a handful of something from his chest. A black sphere, with barbed thorns sticking out in clusters. Vikir recognized at a glance what it was. The seed of the tree of hell. Yes. Do you come out when you're bored? Floro's answered instead. The red poisonous dance was gathering around me again. The reason why space is distorted is probably not only due to the seeds of the Neric tree. It's space movement magic. It's quite high class, bro. The urgent voices of Camus and Sinclair were heard from behind. Bakir gritted his teeth and increased his speed, but it seemed like he would not be able to completely block the numerous seeds of the hell tree flying in front of his eyes. If you get hit by that, you don't know what will happen. If you are dragged into a fantasy world again, there is no answer. It would be a really big deal if I were to be dragged into the abyss once again in such an urgent war situation. Vikir had no choice but to give up on attacking head on. But at that very moment. Vikir. Go. There was a voice that opened the way for Vikir. Puff puff. An entity that opens the way for Vikir by using its whole body to block the seeds of the tree of hell that fly in like volcanic bombs. Vikir couldn't help but open his eyes wide at the unexpected help. Piggy. He was gritting his teeth, his body covered in blood. Episode 469, The Beginning of a Counterattack, 5. Scram. In the dark. Piggy was once again placed in the same circumstances. The difference was that this time Piggy himself was aware that this was an illusion. Oh, is this a memory from your childhood? Piggy looked at his younger self and the middle-aged man standing in front of him. It was a face I felt like I had seen many times before, but strangely I couldn't remember it. It was just obscured like fog. Such trash is not in my blood. Memories from the distant past that even Piggy himself could not remember are replayed. It was the same vision I had when I had just entered Colossio Academy and almost died while taking the midterm exam. I seemed to be particularly good at seeing illusions. It was like that during my academy days, it was like that when I was trapped in the abyss, and it's still like that now. I was now somewhat accustomed to experiencing strange hallucinations and visions whenever my life was at stake. However, she cannot get used to her mother's crying every time, and a corner of her heart feels cold. And the contempt and hatred that followed that mother. I don't even know how lowly the topic is. Kick me out of here immediately. Get rid of it. The whispers around me follow the whimpers, swirling around. After that, Piggy's vision changed several times. A fleeing mother, forests and mountains, pursuers, steep cliffs, rough rivers, hungry wolves, and the surprised faces of passing bands of merchants and mercenaries. As time passes, so do memories. Her mother, who never smiled and always looked at her with a sad expression. The stepfather was a reliable supporter of the family by always providing kind comfort by the mother's side and generous love to the son. In the face of my father's dedicated efforts, my mother was gradually able to smile. And then the entrance ceremony follows. Colossio Academy, the best university in the empire. Piggy wanted to show something to his mother, who was full of misfortune, and to his father, who devoted his life to making his unhappy mother happy. But not everything was smooth. Piggy was bullied at the first school she entered. This was because of his unique timid personality. Unlike his outstanding brain, his relatively weak body made Piggy frustrated in various tests. The scenery of Naraksu continuing after the academy days. Motives who brutally kill each other. And the next scene that unfolded was a world completely burned down. 
The world is gradually becoming desolate amid rampant monsters and a civil war that breaks out every day. However, Piggy was bravely overcoming all of this. The reason Piggy was able to persevere without giving up her attachment to life despite all kinds of hardships and adversity. It's okay now. It was thanks to the voices of my friends who were always behind me. Piggy, who could have a distorted view of the world, was always supported by his relationships with his friends. Piggy unconsciously smiled and muttered at the blunt but warm voice coming from behind. He's a good person. Moment. Uh. Come to think of it. This is an auditory hallucination that I also heard when I fought with Andusias, the fifth city, Simeris, the third city, and Andreolphus, the third city. He's a good person. An auditory hallucination that embarrassed countless demons. That was what he heard every time his blood flowed into the demons. Moment. Phew. There was a face sticking out in front of Piggy. I cannot hear you. Get out. That's it. OMG. Piggy opened his eyes. Then the first thing that came into view was a face. Vikir. Vikir was looking down at Piggy's face. It's okay now, Piggy. The voice was exactly like the voice I had heard in my auditory hallucination. Piggy smiled weakly with his eyes growing blurry. After all, you are a good person. In the past and now. Piggy. Come to your senses. The bleeding has stopped. Vikir shook Piggy's body. But even though the bleeding had stopped, too much blood was lost. The seed of the maw tree spread like a buckshot, lodged itself deep in Piggy's body and tore up all of his internal organs. Piggy answered, swallowing the blood that was welling up in his eyes. Closing the abyss is my only strength. Even though I can't do anything, I really wanted to help. Sounds stupid. Vikir opened his mouth but Piggy shook his head. Go. Go and kill the devil. I have to save the world. Piggy looked at Vakir with all his strength in his eyes. Even if I don't become a hero, I'm very satisfied if I can remain a hero's friend. Go. At Piggy's shout, Vakir gritted his teeth. In front of me, the harvester is still standing tall, holding a scythe. After that, Floros was activating an ultra-long-distance magic circle this time. Get out of the way. Vikir put Piggy down on the ground and swung his sword at the harvester. Chong. The harvester willingly countered Vikir's slash, as if he could do whatever he wanted to buy time. Quagajik. Vikir's blade fell and the harvester's scythe caught it. When there was a brief confrontation between the two. I know who you are. Piggy's voice instantly made the harvester's whole body tremble. Piggy's dying eyes were looking as if they were contemplating something. He is the devil, you are being lied to. And you have the power to see through it. Piggy coughed and spat out a few mouthfuls of black blood. And with difficulty, he continued speaking. I don't think you're a bad person. Because we were friends. However, Piggy's words did not last until the end. Piggy's hand, which appeared to be smiling weakly as he said the word, friend, soon fell limply to the floor. Piggy. Tudor and Sancho ran crying, but were blocked by the wall of the last German guards. The harvester raised his scythe and shook off Vakir's sword. Pow! Blood spurted out from his chest and limbs, but his intended goal had already been achieved. This was because Floros had completed the space movement magic circle. Come here, my eldest son. Floro smiled and summoned the harvester. For some reason, even now that he had lost all his German soldiers and was being defeated, he still had a big smile on his face. Can I ask you a favor? Ask? You to me what? It's about killing a man. If he were alive, he would look like this by now. Floros, who recalled the recent past, exclaimed in a satisfied tone, as if he had done an extra business. The purpose of coming here has already been achieved. Everyone retreat. Survive on your own. Floro's cry shocked everyone gathered at the water source. Vikir noticed the utmost satisfaction and accomplishment in Floro's voice. Also, why he, the master of lies, brought all his troops to the water source, and even the real reason and purpose. Oh no. 
When Vikir turned his head, he saw Piggy lying bleeding. Floro's smiling gaze is fixed on Piggy, who is turning cold and hard with his eyes closed. The purpose of the devil coming to Tochka was not to kill the devil hunter. His purpose in the first place was to kill Piggy. Demon hunter, I will postpone my conversation with you until later. I promise. It won't take long. You will soon realize that today is just a taste. Because my poisonous soldiers are much more numerous than this. Floros shouted from within the magic circle emitting bright light. However. Piggy never dies. Vikir's speech was short, as always. Only you will die. At the same time, eight strong teeth rush in, tearing the magic circle apart. A slash more vicious and deadly than ever before. Even Floros in the world couldn't help but break into a cold sweat at Vikir's deadly will and tenacity. Son. Hurry and stop that. At Floro's command, the Reaper immediately raised his scythe. However. Aren't we friends? Trust each other. The Harvester's whole body stiffens upon hearing Vikir's voice. In an instant, the Harvester's face was revealed beneath the destroyed hood. Vikir looked at the Harvester with straight eyes. And that very moment of hesitation brought about a big change. Flash. The fiercely meshed teeth took a big bite of the light pillar emanating from the magic circle. K A A A A A of 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 course of 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 course not of such of 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 course of of such. Floros screams in unexpected shock and pain. At the same time, the magic circle shook greatly. Pot. The red poisonous dance and light enveloped Floros and the harvester and swallowed them up. And a surprising silence fell. The place where a fierce battle had been taking place just moments ago became as quiet as a tomb. The devil I missed just moments before. And a comrade who lost his life. Everyone who came together, even though it was belated, could not say anything in the face of this tragedy. From afar, the sounds of the Allied forces subduing the remnants of the German soldiers can be heard. Camus, Ian, Dolores, Sinclair, Serco, and everyone else just stood behind Vikir and said nothing. And. Vikir's lips moved as heavily as hardened lead. The really big fight is about to begin. Everyone's expressions hardened when Vikir said that the real fight had not yet begun. A time when greater and more enormous sacrifices will be required. The finale of all these stages will come soon. Episode 470, The Beginning of a Counterattack, 6. The Nature of Leviathan. Flash. The entire basement became brightly lit. The space movement magic circle that occupied a huge area completely lost its effectiveness. This magic circle, which allows you to travel extremely long distances in just one go, requires a huge amount of money and manpower to install, but its effect is certain. Floro stood up in a state of complete disrepair. As he walked out of the halo of light, his left arm and chest were completely torn off. Damn you demon hunter. I was persistent until the end. It would have been truly dangerous if the heart had not been moved to the right at the moment of crisis. One thousand losses. The moment you feel relieved at the end, you may have lost your life. The devil kills. The demon hunter's last growl was still vivid in my ears. Floros trembled once. And then he was surprised at how his body reacted. Am I shaking? A fear deeply imprinted in the unconscious. Floros shook his head and tried to shake off his thoughts. That can't be possible. It's just a result of consuming too much magical power. I'm tired. But I couldn't help but feel sick inside. In any case, it is true that in the end, he was chased away by a mere human. Floros sat down on a chair in a corner of the stone chamber. Then, with his bloodshot eyes shining, he opened his mouth. Once again, all German soldiers are sent to Tochka. This time there will be no comparison with the Battle of Suwon. Even if water was drawn from the water source, life would only be extended by three days at most. Tochka, which lacked drinking water, was not a suitable place for a sit-in protest. The poison here is infinite. It's a fight you can't lose. In other words, the demon hunters stuck in Tochka are still just flies. All you have to do is bring in more troops and completely isolate them. 
this was also a battle of pride. It is a fight to restore the pride that was torn away during the Battle of Suwon. I will not leave a single human in Tachka alive. Floros looked at the Ouroboros spear in his hand. The two snakes that crawled out of the sack made of hell trees entered the jar again, biting each other's tails, spinning around and starting to create poisonous fog. Infinite poison. Infinite poison. There is no family or force that can stop the current Leviathan family. The same was true even if it was a union of the remaining families. Soon the first prince will become emperor. Even in a civil war or a racial war, I become the victor. And that will be the right time to achieve a great cause. When Floros was hesitating about his future plans, the black robed man who had collapsed in the magic circle got up and seemed to have come to his senses. Harvester. Floros, looking at him, smiled with Hobbes' face. Well done, my successor. Thanks to this, I was able to grant the crown prince's request. It was the most appropriate decision to sow the seeds of the maw tree in the end. The harvester stands still and does not respond. Floros waved his hand, probably thinking it was because of fatigue. Okay. It must be very difficult. Go and rest. We will be busy mass-producing poisonous bottles for a while, so please return to the production site as soon as your physical strength is recovered. And as soon as the poison army is completed, it heads straight to Tachka. This is the time to end it once and for all. Soon our family will rule the world. At Floro's words, the harvester simply bowed his head deeply. The harvester took off the black hood that covered his face. There was pale skin, deep dark circles, and the face of a young man whose youthful appearance had not gone away despite the passage of time. Grenui. He sighed deeply and sank into the sofa. He entered the Colossio Academy, the best university in the empire, as the third son of Leviathan, a highly poisonous hermit, and returned to his family after earning the honor of graduating early as the valedictorian. He became a member of Comprachicos, a core force of Leviathan's original family and one of the strongest poison mutants. His life was clearly solid as he rose to the rank of captain of Comprachicos. But, although he succeeded in obtaining the high position he had longed for, a position where he received recognition and respect from everyone in his family, and a much more successful life than his arrogant older brothers, he could not help but feel somewhat empty. Since when did it start? What did you do when you saw that your uncle, whom you had been close to since childhood, who was eccentric but always kind to you, was slowly becoming mentally unstable after participating in a drug experiment? Or when you watched your classmates die in the abyss? What if you are in a position where you have to silently look down on the process of countless people turning into Germans? In the midst of this chain of thoughts, a voice suddenly resonated in Granui's head. I don't think you're a bad person. Because we were friends. Piggy. A classmate who had a blurry face that didn't have anything special, but for some reason remained in my memory. The moment I remembered his end, my hands, which had never trembled during the entire time I had killed so many people, began to tremble. One day, the voice of a friend I heard a long time ago also lingers in my ears. Why are you so nice to me? Well, we're friends. Granui bit his lip. Vikir. Granui himself could not define exactly how to express the emotions he felt upon reuniting with him. However, what clearly comes to mind is that those eyes that did not break down until the end were indeed the same as before. A guy who always had a reason for everything he did. Even though he was a classmate of the same age, he was someone I couldn't help but follow and respect, and although I always tried to chase after him and surpass him, I couldn't even reach him in the end. That guy has crossed the unimaginably harsh lines of fire and is now standing here, blocking him. Just as there has always been belief and reason behind one's actions, it will be the same this time as well. Granui groaned in a low voice. As my thoughts reached this point, a question that I had been putting off for a long time arose. Am I living properly right now? Mass produce poisonous soldiers to wipe out hostile forces and make the first crown prince emperor. The true unification of the empire, uniting the seven divided powers into one. Rattling. At that moment, Granui felt a foreign body sensation in his left chest. Necklace. With a small brooch in the shape of lips. It's an item I've been wearing around my neck for a while, but have never really paid much attention to. 
But today, this caught Granui's attention especially. Putting Lips An artifact I received as a prize from the college league when I was a freshman. In fact, the ranking at that time would have been impossible if not for Vakir. Everyone else got good artifacts, but I was sullen because I got something useless. It is an artifact that tells the truth by answering yes or no only once, no matter what the question is. This artifact, which is said to have been made from the cut lips of a real wise man a long time ago, allowed each person to ask only one question. Cool time is about 100 years. In fact, it can be seen as an artifact just for Granui. Granui quietly looked at his dry lips. Now that I think about it, I remember. The conversation I had with my classmate when I first got this artifact. What is this to me? Why does it look like a very good artifact? Sometimes I have a lot of doubts about whether I am living well. I think it would be a good idea to ask at that time. TSK, why do I have such skepticism? I'm always living well. People should be confident. Sinclair. The words that the woman he had once admired, smiling brightly, suddenly popped out of Granui's old memories. It's the right lips. Granui recalled the series of events that had occurred so far. A life full of inferiority complex where he was ignored by his older brothers, the pressure of having to live up to his family's expectations, the tragedy of Uncle Sikiak, who was his only refuge, geniuses from other families he met at the academy, a small friendship that bloomed in the underworld, rapid success at his home, Sue. The appointment as a commander who commands countless German soldiers, the task of transforming countless people into Germans, and war another war. Granui raised his head. A black cloak hanging on a hanger, and a huge scythe leaning at an angle. Granui reached out, wrapped himself in a cloak, and picked up a scythe. Life Harvester Granui turned his head and looked at the scene unfolding beyond the darkness. Among the numerous iron bars, Germans were seen scratching the bars with their teeth and fingernails. Beings that were once people. Designed to cause people to lose their senses due to drugs and abuse and hate everything in this world. Granui turned his head. Then he lifted his hand and placed it on his left chest. My father said. They are evil, we are good, and we, Leviathan, will become the best family and furthermore, we will become prophets who will revive mankind. They are small sacrifices for that day, and after death, they will be saved by God and enjoy glory and power forever as heroes who stood at the forefront of the temple. Thought after thought bites my tail. My father's words, my uncle's last appearance, classmates who reunited on the battlefield after graduation. Yet. Granui opened his eyes as if he had made a decision. After thinking about it three times, he finally put his hand on his left chest and asked. Is the judgment I'm about to make right? And soon, a small light erupted from Granui's left chest. Dalsack. The right lips were trying to give a proper answer. Episode 471, Tachika Annihilation Battle, 1. Drinking water has run out. There was a solemn energy in the Tachika fortress. Thindi Wendy, who had spread out the map, opened her mouth with a serious expression. We succeeded in bringing in water from the water source, so we were able to survive for three more days. It's really impossible now. Although the influx of refugees has decreased significantly since the siege of Suwon, the number of people already gathered within the fortress is enormous. It was natural for Thindi Wendy, who was responsible for providing food and water to their mouths, to feel sick. Meanwhile, Osiris, who was sitting close to Thindi Wendy, also had an expression as serious as Thindi Wendy. Levier or something came with a very determined plan this time. Germans were spread out in the rocky area below the mountain peak. If you look at the troops alone, they are more than three times that of this side. Although Tachka Fortress is an iron fortress that is advantageous to water defenses, it only works in battles between a small number of people and when both sides have large troops, the story is different. Thindi Wendy and Osiris talked in a serious tone. Anyway, since we don't have enough drinking water, tomorrow's battle will be limited, and we will have to decide within that limit. Is this an all-out war? There is no other way. Since the troops are troops, large and small local battles will continue even outside Tachka Fortress. The good news among the misfortunes is that there are many excellent commanders here. Outstanding commanders such as Orca and Saad, 
as well as brave and powerful commanders from each family, are also gathered leading the elite troops. Although it was hopeless, it was a good idea to try to break through head on. What do you want to do, little brother? When Osiris looked up, there stood Vikir. Vikir did not answer for a while. I'm just looking out the window and counting the stars in the night sky. Is it starry night? Please come up with some kind of solution. You were the one who said all you had to do was hang on here. Thindi Wendy was there. Osiris, who normally would have stopped her, also showed signs of impatience today, which was rare. It was natural given the circumstances. Right then. Y-N-G. A ray of night wind blew through the wide open window. Ha! Huh. What kind of wind? Thindi Wendy and Osiris covered their faces with their hands. It is natural for this wind to blow in when the window is open. However, Vikir's expression, who had been silent until now, suddenly changed. Vikir lightly moistened his index finger with saliva and held it upright. Southeast wind. Vikir opens all the windows facing different directions and checks the direction from which the wind is blowing at the same time. Afterwards, Vikir returned to the southeast window where he had always spent his time standing still. And I started looking at the constellations hanging in a corner of the night sky. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven stars commonly called guiding stars. It is a special constellation that is visible only from a specific direction and has been a guide to countless people since ancient times. Y-N-G. The night wind blows once again. As expected, this time it was a southeasterly wind. Only then did Thindi Wendy and Osiris notice something strange. Now that I think about it, has there ever been a breeze coming in from this window? It seemed like there had never been a wind blowing from the window where Vikir always stayed. After realizing this trivial fact, for some reason, an inexplicable feeling of excitement was building in the hearts of Thindi Wendy and Osiris. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Vikir continues counting the stars. Even the young shepherds living in this area know that there are seven guiding stars in the night sky of the northern wall. But. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. The number of stars that Vikir counted as the third was slightly different. 8. The very tip of the guiding star. There is one star shining blue there. The light of the eighth star, which was formed after the seven guiding stars, shines coldly as it penetrates Vikir's retina. Vikir, who had been silently counting the stars, finally nodded. Good. There's finally one more. It has settled down for sure. Thindi Wendy and Osiris could only tilt their heads at Vikir's incomprehensible sound. Soon, Vikir, who had remained silent despite everyone's encouragement and scolding, made his move. Tomorrow noon will be the final battle. It seemed like a sudden declaration, but Thindi Wendy and Osiris could feel it. Tomorrow's battle is the stage that Vikir has been planning and designing for a very long time, the final stage in the true sense of the word. It's twelve o'clock in the afternoon with the scorching sun pouring down. The German army that was surrounding Tachka began to move. Director Orca's expression, as he was about to enter the final battle, was as tense as ever. Now that even the last drop of drinking water has disappeared, we can no longer look forward to tomorrow. I'm not even sure if I'll be able to reach midnight today or not. Puss onzing onwards on an old man on living just twelve more hours. The Marquis de Sade chuckles next to Director Orca. However, unlike the corners of his mouth that were always curled up, his eyes were not smiling. Puss, there are no more troops and no more water. It's truly an extreme situation. It's been a long time since I've had a battle like this. Was it about fifty years ago? Ever since the fight with the Baskerville dogs at the Uni Salt Flats. It's noisy, escaped prisoner. I'm not even remotely curious about your saga, so go talk somewhere else. Ah, it might be the last time, but I'm still being rude. The Marquis de Sade pouted and closed his mouth. The two of them sat far away from each other on the castle pedestal and were silent for a long time. Eventually, Orca spoke first. Die without shame. Ha! Huh. When Saad frowned as if wondering what he was talking about, Orca opened her mouth again and continued. I hate to admit it, but you are from the same generation as me. Other than me, 
he is the only one still active. So. Whether we like it or not, you and I have come to represent our generation. Don't end it on an ugly note. Puss, take care of yourself, old man. Escaped prisoner. I gave him advice with good intentions. The two evil friends did not look at each other until the very end. I am just facing the poisonous rain that covers the horizon in the distance in dark red. Soon, the troops were divided into two, led by Orca and Saad. Orca on Mercury, and Thad on counterattack. The House of Morg and the House of Quavadis, specialized in defense, guarded the outer castle of Taka under Orca's command, while the House of Baskerville and House of Bourgeois, specialized in attack, caught the enemy off guard under the command of Saad. Oh ooh. Huge German soldiers began to flock towards the castle walls. Orca's eyebrows twitched. The German soldiers currently appearing on the front lines were all wearing familiar uniforms. The black blood-like robe of the iron-blooded swordsman Baskerville, the red robe of the sorcerer Morgue, the white priestly robe of the religious Himquo Vadis, and the golden cloak of the rich bourgeoisie. These clothes, all dry and tattered, clearly took the form of shrouds. Did they rob each family's tombs? Ancestors of the Baskervilles, the Morgue, the Quo Vadis, and the bourgeoisie. Those who had processed their corpses into poison soldiers, or rather, dead soldiers, were flocking in. It was the moment when the evil of the grave robberies that shook the entire empire in the past was revealed. Coo 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 coo. The Baskerville swordsmen stood at the forefront, with only bones, skin, and poison remaining. The spiders of the sea of trees facing them stood on the wall of Tachika, their fur bristling on end. Madam Young glanced her head. There, a separate unit was seen moving independently without receiving instructions from Thad. Vikir. The person who operates the separate unit. Vikir was quietly watching the German dead soldiers appearing at the front line in the distance. Rather, what was growling with the will to go on a rampage was the detachment standing behind it, and the seven hunting dogs that commanded that detachment. Boston Terrier, Les Baskerville, leader of the Pitbull Knights. Les Baskerville, the Great Dane, leader of the Mastiff Knights. Isabella, La Baskerville, leader of the Doberman Knights. German, Les Baskerville, leader of the Shepherd Knights. Les Baskerville, Metzgerhund, leader of the Rottweiler Knights. Siuchulin, Les Baskerville, leader of the Wolfhound Knights. They stayed quietly behind, waiting for Vikir's instructions. Except for the two who were bickering noisily from earlier. Killing a lot is best. You say killing the big guy is the best. The Boston Terrier, the leader of the Pitbull Knights, and the Great Dane, the leader of the Mastiff Knights, have been in a constant state of nervousness since a while ago. And Isabella, the leader of the Doberman Knights, who was looking at the two with a pitiful gaze, walked between the two and whispered to Vakir. Processing the corpses of our ancestors into undead is counterproductive. Rather, it increases their anger and increases their combat power. Thanks to this, short-term firepower will increase dramatically. Isabella's judgment was cold and accurate. German, the leader of the Shepherd Knights, also showed a rare attitude of agreeing with his rival Isabella's opinion by nodding his head. I think so too. If it had been a long-term war, it would have definitely led to a decline in morale on this side, but we had run out of drinking water anyway. Even the burning thirst will be forgotten for a moment if the anger burns even hotter than that. Meanwhile, Metzgerhund, leader of the Rottweiler Knights, turned his head as if he was not interested in such things. His eyes remained focused solely on Vikir. My nephew. From what I heard, your sixth meal is amazing, right? I won't ask you how you acquired that level of skill. I want to take this opportunity to clearly see your skills. Me too. The fourth sick is the sword sick that I enjoy the best. If you say that you do not have a desire to win as a craftsman, it's false. The gaze of Kukulin, leader of the Wolfhound Knights, was also fixed on Vakir from earlier. Since they are experts who would be disappointed to be second in the sixth and fourth formulas, respectively, they seem to want to use this opportunity to compare their skills with Vakir. The tense muscles swell to the point of bursting, and the tendons flutter violently. These hunting dogs are ready to jump out at any time, like a stretched rubber band. In this imminent situation, Vikir took something out of his pocket. It's a red whistle. 
it was a symbol of the Baskerville family's military power. At the same time, a sharp whistle echoed across the dry sky. Quack! Many of the Baskerville's fighting dogs kicked the ground and shot forward. Black shadows running in the sand dust. It is a very different production from the wind blowing in the barley field. The final battle was now beginning. Episode 472, Tachika Annihilation Battle, 2. Black shadows sway in the dust. The Baskerville's hounds run like the wind that shakes the barley ears. And those standing in their way were the fighting dogs of the previous generation. Crunch suddenly less. The swordsmen of the Baskerville family, with only their skeletons and skins remaining, walk towards us with their shrouds waving. Every time I took a step forward, there was a loud sound of rusty metal pieces, chipped teeth, and jaw bones colliding. Chong. The famous swords of the previous generation revealed their teeth that had turned into saw blades. Against him are Isabella, German, Boston Terrier, Great Dane, Kukulin, and Metzgerhund. A total of six knight commanders also selected their favorite soldiers. Count Boston Terrier, holding a knife, was the first to jump out in front of the display. The Great Dane Count was next. Ha ha ha. How can you imitate active duty when you're an old dog with no teeth? Hey. These are our ancestors. Therefore. If you're tired, just lie down quietly and wait and then eat the ancestral rites. The two clash fiercely with the Baskerville's dead soldiers wearing shrouds. The wide slash characteristic of the Boston Terrier was attacking many dead soldiers at once. The violent, storm-like slashes were irregular and chaotic, but they were just as destructive. On the other hand, the Great Dane slash is thin but dense. A large dead soldier rushed forward, relying only on his own size, but was crushed in half by the Great Dane slash, which was carrying an enormous amount of weight. After that, Isabella and German jumped to the front lines. Why don't you come over to me and go over there instead of running wild? Joy. Are you trying to monopolize the results for just four years? There is such a difference in military strength, so where is the monopoly? These two people have often been told that men and women seem to have changed. German began to catch up with Isabella, showing both a sense of rivalry and a sense of victimization. Isabella, in keeping with her unique personality, considered extreme efficiency and economy, and began to shift the trajectory of the sword as if she were putting down a baduck stone. With only minimal movement and aura, dozens of dead soldiers have already collapsed. German was also showing off his swordsmanship skills that were on par with Isabella. The dead German soldiers, whose strength was comparable to hundreds of German soldiers, were collapsing like scarecrows. Meanwhile, Metzgerhund and Kukulin were closely following Bakir, the leader of the detachment, on both sides as if they were guarding him. Meal 6. Let's see meal 6. Four meals. Compete with four meals. Both of them are very proud of their swordsmanship, and are even arrogant. However, since the level of extreme intention has been reached, such level of craftsmanship is natural. Whirly lick, qua geek. Vikir had no choice but to deploy the sixth form as he felt the stinging gaze on his back. The six teeth pierced through the poisonous soldiers without mercy. Vikir's sixth formula, honed over the years flowing like flowing water in the abyss, was definitely ranked among the masters. Puff puff puff. Of course, type 4 was also the same. The four teeth that I had fiercely forged throughout my life in my past life showed their full effect in this life. The four teeth stretched out naturally, as if breathing, and tore the dead soldiers in front to shreds. Oh oh. Indeed. Metzgerhund and Kukulin couldn't help but admire the energy of Vikir spitting out the fourth and sixth meals almost simultaneously. Of course, the more this happened, the more their competitive spirit was inflamed. Quajajajajik. The Metzgerhund's meat-eating and Kukulin's eating habits were literally like a watermill crushing meat, crushing the German's cordon. The Baskerville's military dogs are steadily closing the distance behind the seven counts, who are breaking through the most closely fought front line as if it were a no man's land. And at the forefront of all these was Vikir. Puff puff puff. Whenever Vikir launches the magic sword Beelzebub, dozens of heads decorate the sky. Whying. The humid southeast wind blowing from afar was sweeping away the fishy scent of blood. 
At that time, something came into the distance of Vikir's field of vision, who was leading a detachment and breaking through the front lines. Skinny giant bodies emerging through the red fog and dust. Oh! Ooh. It was a unit of tall, poisonous soldiers who were over a dozen meters tall. He has a very tall stature, and his muscles and skeleton have weakened due to his obsession with increasing his height, but he is physically strong enough to reach the top of Tochka's castle walls when he stretches out his grotesquely long arms. They were slowly walking from beyond the front lines, spouting red mist of death from the pores of their bodies. They appear to be objects specially manufactured to attack the high walls of Tochka. If you allow things like that to approach the castle walls, it will be a headache for the castle walls. Of course, Director Orca will take care of it, but it would still be better to minimize the burden on Tochka's nature. Because there are refugees there who need to be protected. Fortunately, the approach speed is slow due to the poor skeleton. It would be better to cut them down before they get close to the walls. Vikir made a quick decision. Separate unit. Let's hit the giant ghosts over there first. Ancient. The seven counts put away their swords and turned away without saying a word at Vikir's command. The same was true for the seven hundred knights who followed him. Vikir is about to drive a detachment across the battlefield. At that time, a sound of laughter came from next to me. Puss, where are you running so hard? I envy your youth. When I turn my head, I see an old man standing on a tall, strangely shaped rock formation on the side of Vikir. Marquis de Sade. He appeared like a ghost without any trace. Behind them were nouvelle vague all-stars such as Dordian, Soiret, BDSM, Flubber, and Circo. The same goes for Suddy who was transformed into a demon. Bikir asked in a somewhat absurd tone. What combination is it? Are you under arrest? Poos. Orca, I borrowed it from that old man. A small elite team is good for counterattacking. The Marquis de Sade is the Marquis de Sade who laughs it off as if it is no big deal even though he is under the control of the guards who once imprisoned him. Of course, the expressions of Dordium and Soiret behind the Marquis de Sade were completely rotten. In particular, the facial expression of Soiret, who was managing the solitary confinement where the Marquis de Sade was held, was quite something to see. The Marquis de Sade asked. Well, anyway, were you going to the castle wall? Okay. It would be a pain if something big like that were attached to the castle wall. Puss, you're quick to judge. It's also accurate. The judgments of the Marquis de Sade, a master of tactics, and Vikir were exactly the same. At that time, the gaze of the Marquis de Sade, who was about to turn around after speaking, turned to the six men and women standing behind Vikir. Ho oh, oh, I was wondering where these fresh-faced assassins were coming from. Are you the new seven counts of the Baskervilles? The brows of the six men and women all furrowed at the word, new bee. The Boston Terrier, Great Dane, Isabella, German, Metzgerhund, and Kukulin all showed their will to win by throwing sharp attacks at the Marquis de Sade. Ugh, aren't you too old to be on the battlefield, senior? I think the line is closer to the dead soldier standing over there than to us. Hey, how disrespectful is that to the great senior of the squadron? It must have taken a lot of courage for the older man to come out of the back room. I have nothing to say to you, who is classified as a top-class war criminal even by the Empire. After the civil war is over, I will put you back in the bread. It's really disgusting how prisoners launder their image. Consider yourself lucky, old man. The old monster of the previous generation, the Marquis de Sade. He's the perfect opponent to test my now more advanced meat-eating habits. Strong man. I want to stick together. The Marquis de Sade chuckled as he saw the seven counts each preparing to fight. The older the puppies are, the more they bark. There is no particular character in this generation's Baskervilles. As expected, it's the Cane Corso, just that old guy. Right then. Puff puff puff. A loud explosion erupted from the castle wall. Vikir and the Marquis de Sade, who were approaching the castle walls, stopped at the same time. The tall poisonous soldiers who were about to reach for the castle were collapsing one after another. You can see a black storm blowing underneath them, amputating the ankles of German soldiers. Oh, there's a really useful guy over there, right? Who is it? 
the Marquis de Sade shows interest. The army guarding the bottom of the castle wall, cutting off the ankles of German soldiers, soon began to approach this side. Eventually, the being standing at the forefront of the black wind appeared in front of Akir. Even though we heard the red whistle, we were a little late in gathering. I don't want to use age as an excuse, but the years have passed. But. The moment he heard his voice, Bakir couldn't help but look surprised. A neatly tailored suit, a stylish mustache, and a polite greeting. Really? You really grew up well, master. Deacon John Barrymore was there. Episode 473, Tachika Annihilation Battle, 3. The battle becomes increasingly fierce. The hand of the clock on which Tachka's fate depended was slowly sinking, and it was already indicating four o'clock in the afternoon. Chiak. One huge poison bottle was cut in half. Deacon Barrymore, who saw the Marquis de Sade whipping the whip and shaking off the blood, clapped his hands and said. It's still great work. Puss, still. Do you remember my old skills? Honestly, I have encountered it more through books and papers than with the naked eye. It's more than just a record. John Barrymore. He, who has been loyal to the Baskerville family for as many as four generations, continued speaking as he cut down countless bottles of poison with the sword in his hand. It's strange. What do you mean? What I mean is that right now I, know, everyone gathered here is under the command of the Marquis. It is amazing that people who once fought over the fate of the Empire are now joining hands. Deacon Barrymore was answering the Marquis de Sada's questions while knocking down Germans one after another with an undisturbed attitude. Meanwhile, Bakir, seeing this, opened his mouth slightly. I had no idea that the butler had such great swordsmanship skills. He he he, even after all this, I'm an expert at dog fighting. When I was young, there were many times when I hit and fought with the matriarch. At that time, my odds of winning were a little better. In fact, I once heard the elders of the Baskerville say in passing that, looking at Barrymore, that son of a bitch became a man back then. Is this a case of becoming gentler with age? Looking at that gentle mustache right now, it's something I can't even imagine. Bakir thought as he split the head of the giant poisonous soldier blocking his path like splitting a watermelon. On the other hand, Barrymore's eyes were filled with emotion as she looked at Bakir. You grew up really well, master. I still remember that day when I was choosing chocolate from the food warehouse, I'm sure the head of the family will be pleased. When the word matriarch came out, Bakir quietly turned his head. Where is Hugo now that the full force of the Baskervilles is here? Barrymore then caught Bakir's gaze and smiled naturally. The matriarch has gathered all the regular troops and is coming straight this way. Since you're on your way through the civil war zone, you're a little late compared to the other troops who took a detour. At that time. Quack 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 quack. A loud roar erupted that obscured the conversation between Vikir and Deacon Barrymore. One of the poison bottles tore in strange directions, and angry voices clashed on both sides. How dare you stab me, you crazy bitch. Suddy. She, transformed into a demon with Belial's eyeballs, was screaming sharply. And in the direction where her eyes widen, I see another woman standing there. Oh sorry. I didn't know it was a human baby. It was only when he unleashed all his demon energy like that. Beware of the blind knife. The woman who handed Suddy an apple that was not an apple was none other than Isabella La Baskerville. She, the leader of the Doberman Knights belonging to the Baskerville family, struck again and cut down the Germans. Even though Suddy was right next to him, he showed no consideration at all. Suddy narrowly avoided Isabella's knife by tilting her head back and growled with sharp teeth. Oh, are you going to kill me with a blind knife? This ugly year, it's still a dog. But you, too, are still in a bad mood. Well, I wonder where the bloodline of a traitor goes. Ho ho ho, why did you recommend such a traitor's blood to the Imperial Arrest Team? And that too as his successor. It is the regret of my life that I handed over the handover to a person like you. It's a stain. Isabella seemed to be trying to gently erase a stain from her life as the melee was going on. Of course, Suddy was also anxious to kill his former predecessor. Right then. Pow! A spear of rock suddenly protruded from the ground, 
separating Suddy and Isabella. A poisonous bottle fell from the sky and was nailed in the air without even touching the ground. A taunt was heard directed at the two of them retreating, each losing a few strands of bangs. It's a shame. I wish they both were dead. So where was standing where Suddy and Isabella's gaze was directed. The three women's gazes met in one place. Ho ho ho, what kind of Themyscira women's college reunion is this? There are three classmates from our class gathered here. Alumni. You trash bitches, don't you dare mention my alma mater's name. It's nice to see the faces of my old dorm roommates after a long time. Life in the deep sea was so lonely that I didn't like it. Suddy, Isabella, Sower. Three classmates who graduated with excellent grades from Themyscira Women's University and went down different paths. One became a rare villain who shook the empire, the other became a count who supported the great family, and the last one became a symbol of protecting the worst prison. But. These three, who thought they would never see each other after their respective career paths changed, were now gathered in one place and working on the same work. It is a struggle to survive. Chiak. One by one, the large poison soldiers collapse, and their places are replaced by smaller poison soldiers. As corpses piled up, the ground rose higher and the Red Death became more powerful. The hour hand was now pointing at six and the Germans were becoming more and more numerous. No, maybe it looks that way because there are fewer allies. At this very moment, Bakir was at the forefront, silently cutting down the Germans. It was now unknown how long the blessings of the priests would last. Right then. Vikir spotted a familiar face not far away. A fairly old Baskerville. We met each other several times before and after the return. A hunting dog that was the same age as the head of the family, Hugo. Was his name Pavlov? Among those with the same middle name, I remembered him because he was the one who survived for a long time. Pavlov Van Baskerville. He slashed at the poisoner with a knife whose teeth had fallen out and turned into saw blades. Quasik. The knife, which was swung like a blunt weapon, did not cut off the poisoner's head, but dented it. Is there not even a single ounce of mana left to make the aura bloom? Just as Vikir was about to move to help Pavlov. Pow! A spear flew from the front and pierced Pavlov's abdomen. Hey! Vikir hurriedly ran over and supported Pavlov's drooping head. Don't lose your mind. Vikir shouts urgently, but Pavlov just looks at Vikir blankly. Soon, his mouth drew an arc. He's a good person. You are. But it's okay. I go about my business. You do your job. After finishing speaking, Pavlov took a final deep breath. And now I let out a breath that I could not breathe again. High-ranking Leviathan appears on the front lines. It was a loud cry that reached the ears of everyone on the battlefield. Everyone, including Bakir, looked ahead. A red fog was spreading ahead, thicker than anywhere else. And the being that emerged through the fog looked familiar to Bakir. This time, Floros. Also known as the Lying Leopard. Its left hand had grown grotesquely long and it was looking down at Bakir with a grin. It was a self-evident fact that the evil beast that had just thrown a spear at Pavlov was Floros. You guys are finished. Floros, who had led a huge number of German soldiers, was passing through Vikir and looking at the walls of Taka beyond. It's a miracle that I survived until now without even taking a sip of water. But no matter how much you whine at God, the limits are clear. Now the moment has come to realize reality, bugs. Even if it weren't for the last disparaging remark, there might have been quite a few people who sympathized with Floro's words. Soon, a huge number of German soldiers began to push through the front lines. Retreat. Everyone retreat. Go inside the castle and lock the door. The Marquis de Sade shouts in a rare, urgent tone. Director Orca, who was guarding the castle walls, also gritted his teeth. Yet. Puff puff. A large army of poisonous soldiers began to hang down, holding on to the castle. The small German soldiers were climbing onto the large bodies of the large German soldiers and climbing up the castle wall. Spray oil. Pull the fire. Pour out as much gunpowder as you can. Archers and stokers, hit all the stocks. 
saving money has no meaning anymore. Orca and Sada's instructions matched. Everyone in Tachka blocked the approaching army of poison soldiers. Of course, the result was not enough. The Germans climbed the castle wall using their own hands and used the corpses to build a huge embankment. Now the castle wall has turned into a gently sloping uphill road. It's over. Thindy Wendy, who was watching all this from the watchtower, muttered in a cracked voice. She had not had a sip of water for several days and was feeling defeated. Of course, this was something that everyone fighting on the front lines was feeling more and more clearly. Pow! Tudor stumbled as he saw red blood gushing from his forehead. Now the saint's tears are also losing their power. The flags that were flying everywhere were torn down long ago. A dark shadow is also cast on the faces of the knights. The priests also began to cry instead of praying. German heads were sticking out one by one in front of the castle wall, which was overflowing with evil spirits and the Red Death. Is it really the end now? Even if it is an epic story of a brilliant and splendid hero, there is bound to be an end. Tudor grinned, his vision blurring. I was thinking that the final scene of violent oxidation before the entire world was dyed black and red wouldn't be so bad. It was right then. Perfect. A small noise struck Tudor's ears. It was heard as clearly as a miracle even amidst all the explosions and tearing noises. Talk. The noise is heard again. It was the sound of small stones flying. A rock flew out of the air and hit the forehead of a German who was sticking his head out of the castle wall. Tudor turned his head. And soon, I had to open my eyes, which were hard to open, as if they were torn apart. Babel. I saw a girl whose whole body was shaking like an aspen, but who wasn't moving back at all. Tudor remembered the girl's face and name. My name is Samua. Can you tell me the name of your benefactor? The name is Tudor. There is no castle. A girl I saved from a small rural village I once visited. Shamua, a common name meaning God has heard. Now the child was standing on the wall and throwing stones at the Germans. Tudor. I will help too. Tudor, who heard the girl's cries, looked blank. Bianca sarcastically sat next to him. When did you seduce me? You think that's it? It's dangerous, so we have to get him to leave quickly OMG. But Tudor could not put his words into action. This is because before I knew it, I was faced with the solemn expressions of the family members who appeared behind the girl. And behind that family was an entire village. And behind those people, I saw all the refugees who had flocked to Tachka standing with indignant expressions. Let us fight too. You can't just be protected. One person can do his share. Even though I look like this, I'm a retired soldier. I will repay your kindness by sharing food and water. Protect those who walk the night. All of the enormous number of refugees who had been inside Tachka so far began pouring out. The men picked up spears, long spears, and at least pieces of stone that were lying in the ground. The women nursed the wounded and at the same time brought in the drinking water they had saved despite extreme starvation. Tachka, an iron fortress, is structured so that one girl can defend against 100 soldiers. The Germans who seemed to have climbed over the castle wall started to fall again due to the rain of raindrops and slings. A little light returned to the eyes of Thindy Wendy, who was overseeing all supplies and procurement on the watchtower. The embers that I thought were completely extinguished flare up again. It was the beginning of a counterattack that no one expected. Episode 474 Tachika Annihilation Battle, 4. Even if one person throws just one stone, the number is countless. A large number of people climbed onto the walls of Tachka and began slinging stones with all their might. Tachka is a fortress built on a rocky area. The thing rolling around in the ground is a stone. A huge number of stones. The anger of those who are tired of running away from the cruel wheel of fate, fed up with the hard life and accumulated abandonment, accelerates down the high walls of Tachka Fortress. Patter 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 patter. Naturally, its destructive power was enormous. Puff 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 puff. The German soldiers who were climbing the castle wall tumbled down with their heads broken and exploded. The shower of falling rocks, as powerful as the hail that Andrealfus poured down in the third hour, 
was slowing down the Germans' general offensive. Now. Titan left and right. The Marquis de Sade and Orca realized that this moment was the last chance to counterattack that would never come again. Soon, the two veteran soldiers came out with the last remaining troops and began to pressure the German soldiers from both the left and right wings, out of reach of falling rocks. Bikir was also leading a detachment to push the Germans into a corner. A battle more intense than any battlefield I have ever experienced. It was the bloodiest fight before and after the return. Pew. Bikir thought as he blew off the head of the giant monster that stood in his way. We must use this momentum to rip off the devil's head. That was the only way to end the war. Bikir led the seven counts and seven knights to cross the river of countless Germans. Poisonous blood flowers have bloomed all over the front lines where the hunting dogs have dug deep, and countless heads are rolling around. Quack! The German soldiers tear the earth apart with their huge palms. Bikir stepped aside to avoid the palm of the poisonous bottle that fell directly in front of him. Chiak. The poisoner's chest was split in two, and a fountain of black blood poured out. Right then. Bikir felt a chill burning on the back of his neck. It was not a very rare sensation on the battlefield, it was simply a sign that the enemy was attacking from behind. If it were like usual, all you would have to do was throw your body to the side and avoid it. But the truly unique experience began now. Probillion. The chill on the back of my neck disappeared along with a dull noise. The poisoner who was reaching out from behind was dead. Bikir tried to turn his head to see who had removed the poison, but it was impossible. This is because at this very moment, countless palms of poisonous soldiers were in full bloom on the front lines. Bwake Bwak. Pow. Deng Gung. Bikir stretched out his magic sword, Beelzebub, and cut down all the poisonous soldiers in front of him. And the more I did, the more strange things continued to happen. The German soldiers coming behind Vikir were continuously being defeated. Someone is supporting me. In the midst of his busy schedule, Bikir glanced behind him, but couldn't figure out who was behind him because of the rapidly changing vision and the shower of blood and stones scattered everywhere. Hmm, it's so fast I can't see it clearly. It seems that even Dekaravia was unable to figure out who the helper who is currently watching Bikir's back is. But. Puff. Thud. Wow. One thing was certain that Bakir was supported on his way with almost perfect support. Who is it? Kemu. Ian. Dolores. Sinclair. Serco. But they were already far away from the battlefield. The seven counts and the seven knights who were following right behind them had also long since fallen behind, reaching the end of their physical strength. For now, I have no choice but to believe and go. Bikir decided to trust the mysterious helper who has been watching his back thoroughly without making a single mistake. Flash. Bikir bared his eight teeth at the huge poison bottle that appeared in front of him. Right then. Took Gigi Geek. Bikir's hand stopped in midair. Surprisingly, a poisonous soldier appeared to counter Bikir's sword. A large, poisonous soldier whose entire body is grotesquely distorted. Bikir immediately recognized its identity. The eldest son of the Leviathan family. Is it Suskind? A once promising talent, a next generation prospect who was evaluated to support the empire in the future. But now, it has long since been reduced to nothing more than a demon with a grotesquely twisted body spewing out poison. K. Suskind is holding on without collapsing even though he is hit by Vakir's slash no, what was once Suskind. It opened its mouth so wide that it was torn apart, and showed off its immense grip strength and regenerative power, pushing towards Vakir's blade. For this size, regenerative power it won't be easy. The moment when Vakir frowned and tried to increase his strength. Flash. There was a slash that retraced the trajectory of Vakir's slash just before. Baskerville Type 8. Eight teeth fell straight onto the mark Vakir had made. Quack 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 quack. Suskin's gigantic body was shattered and scattered on the spot. And beneath the shower of flesh and blood, Vakir realized who had supported him all along. Black blood blowing in the wind, red eyes as if looking into a mirror. And the beard that grew from not being able to be shaved while running through the battlefield. 
the supreme swordsman of Baskerville. Master of all hunting dogs. Hugo Les Baskerville was there. A father and son face each other with their eight teeth exposed. Neither Vakir nor Hugo say anything as they look at each other's faces. Hugo was the first to break the silence. Churuk. He swung the famous sword Bamung returned from the bourgeois family once and shook off the blood. And then he spoke calmly, like the sound of wind passing by and leaving no trace. You've grown up well. I haven't done anything for you. Vikir paused for a moment after hearing those words. I wanted to say something, but I didn't know what to say. That short silence was the end. Hugo, who was about to say something more, soon closed his mouth and turned away. And it was clearly revealing the level of the eighth type, which it was unclear whether it had already been reached. Quack 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 quack. A slash that splits the earth and sky simultaneously sweeps away the Germans. Vikir also quickly realized that now was not the time to think about random things. Soon, the father and son began swinging their swords back to back. Hugo stabbed the gap where Vikir's sword had cut. Vikir cut into the gap where Hugo's sword had passed. The presence or absence of a person who can have one's back on the battlefield is very large. Aside from the blood and flesh, there was an awkward and subtle silence flowing between the two, who were slowly turning the situation around. Right then. Ha 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 ha. Laughter is heard from the battlefield beyond. Vikir recognized its owner at a glance. Floros. The source of all evil. It was smiling at Vikir, its eyes shining. Just watch Amon run wild. My poison is infinite. Floros pulled a huge car from behind as if to prove his point. A carriage whose upper part is covered with a black barak. That was the dock charging station that Vikir had seen before while on his way to capture the water source. Oh ooh. German soldiers began to withdraw one by one from the walls of Tachka Fortress. Perhaps it was to enter the black barracks in the back and gain more strength and poison. With this, the number of poisons can increase infinitely. It is my poison that even raises and manipulates corpses. Floros shouted in a confident voice. Even just before the barracks exploded and a loud roar rang out. Quack 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 quack. A barracks where poisonous soldiers recharged their wasted poison. It was now completely engulfed in flames. And in real time. Vikir tilted his head with a blank expression. Why does the dock charging station explode at this point? But I guess Floros was more curious about it. Its expression was extremely distorted as it hurriedly looked back. W. Watt. Why is my Uroboros? At that moment, a familiar face appeared in the eyes of Vikir and Floros. Harvester. Granui de Leviathan, the youngest member of the Leviathan family. He was standing in front of a shattered jar with a sad expression under the burning curtain of the barracks. Inside the jar containing the two snakes Buroboros, that created the Red Death, oil was boiling with great force, spewing out extremely hot oil vapor. Sometimes I have a lot of doubts about whether I'm living a good life. TSK, why do I have such skepticism? I'm always living well. People should be confident. Granui, who found Sinclair's face among the special forces that followed Vakir, muttered with a blank expression. Okay. A person must be confident. A voice that seems to be looking back on some distant memory. The moment Sinclair tilts his head. Wow. Two snakes jumped out of the boiling oil. Despite the terrible burns that fried his entire body, Uroboros gathered his last strength and bit the neck of Granui, who was standing there dazed, and dragged him into the jar. Washishishishish. Hot oil sloshes inside a large jar. Eventually, there was only silence in the barracks. Floros screamed in astonishment as he watched the barracks burning to the ground. Nonsense. How dare this bastard betray. A truly unexpected and absurd event. But Floros could not finish his sentence. Last time, I only took my arm. A voice that freezes eerily in my ears. This time, sacrifice your neck and go. This was because Vakir had caught up with him before he knew it. Episode 475, Tachika Annihilation Battle, 5. This time, sacrifice your neck and go. 
Floros was startled by the eerie voice that froze in his ears and revealed his true face. A leopard's face with its skull clearly exposed, a mane like a black flame, and eyes burning yellow like sulfur. This poem, Floros. Risk level, S+. Plus. Size. Location of discovery, deep inside the gate of destruction, snake's womb. A.K.A. Second Corpse. A natural enemy of mankind, one of the ten plagues known as incomprehensible and unkillable. I will turn the water into blood. Ten Commandments 10 colon 1. This time, Floros. A lying leopard. A being who held the second highest position among the protagonists who led the era of destruction. The prey that Vakir had set as the ultimate goal of this battle was there. Flash. Eight teeth bit into the air. OMG. Floros was scared and stepped back. Now that the Uroboros had been destroyed by Granui, there was no weapon capable of fighting Beelzebub, so it was inevitable. Phew. Floros took a deep breath and exhaled a huge amount of poisonous fog. Red death, an ominous mist that turns the water red, spews out from Floros' mouth. However. Nuclear nucleus. The baby madam that jumped out from behind Vakir sucked up all the red evil spirit of death that Floros had emitted with one breath. Did you see this damn spider? Floros gritted his teeth and sprayed more and more red death, but it was no use. This was because five women appeared on Madam Baby's back. Vikir. Camus, Yen, Dolores, Sinclair, Serco. Among them, Dolores, who was at the forefront, gave protection to Vikir. White divine power was gushing out and burning away the Red Death. The priests of the religious hymn launched a massive counterattack. Madam Young's descendants also gathered together and began to eat the Red Death. The evil spirits of the Red Death that were rampaging throughout the battlefield were gradually being captured by the enemy, the spiders of the Black Mountain, and the priests of the religious in Quo Vadis. Since there is no solo Ouroboros, no more Red Deaths have been produced, and the end is gradually being revealed. As the red water fog clears, Floros's embarrassed appearance is revealed beyond it. Vikir followed right away. You can't miss the opportunity to be a genius. Damn it. Type 4 deployed as quickly as possible and cut Floro's chest deeply. The beating heart could be seen clearly beyond the ribs that exposed the smooth cut edges. After that, numerous attacks were launched. The fire thunderbolts and giant iron skewers created by Camus, Ion's iron sword, Sinclair's golden golem, and Serco's magic sword as Modius bombarded Floros one after another. Floros' body is falling to pieces in the fire. Moreover, Bakir's Type 8 was already completely blocking all directions Floros could escape from. When the situation got to this point, Floros began gritting his teeth. If only it weren't for the damn Granui. How could you doubt my words? Floros seemed curious as to how Granui could see through the false that was his power. Of course, Bakir did not feel any need to answer that question. He didn't even know the answer. Sai, Deng Gung. Both Floros' left and right arms fell off. Vikir said, stabbing Floros in the heart. I told you not to look down on this world. All the causes and causes that I have encountered so far. A totality of organic things. The gigantic wheel of causality they create is not easy to deal with, no matter how powerful the devil is. And now there is a pilgrim here who has walked the thorny path that was more difficult and lonelier than anyone else, and has been rolling since the wheel of asceticism was very small. Vikir. Regressor. A hunting dog who went through another life in the underworld. It bites the back of the neck of its target, even beyond the edge of hell and twisting the time axis. Fyuk. A black fountain of blood rose from Floro's neck. Vikir plunged Beelzebub into Floro's neck with all his might and twisted it with force. Wow! The sound of hard fur being torn and the tough muscle fibers within it breaking. Furthermore, the heavy and dense bones suddenly broke, and all the bundles contained within it were ripped out. Sigh! When Vikir pulled out Beelzebub, Floro's neck and body had already been separated. As time passed, Floros, who had completely melted into Hobbes's body, had to be beheaded without even having time to get his spirit body out of his body. Tuck. Rolling and rolling. Floros' head rolls on the floor. 
a bizarre appearance that is a mixture of Hobbes' face and Floro's face. For a being who had simultaneously started an imperial civil war and a racial war involving two dimensions, those words were quite meaningless. Vikir quietly looked at the supply and demand of the cut-off demons. Although there were still a large number of German soldiers remaining on the battlefield, they had lost their leader and were dying out on their own. The ragtag group of people trampling each other to death were like straw dolls to the Marquis de Sade and Director Orca. As soon as the Tachka allied forces launched a counterattack with momentum, the German soldiers collapsed. A struggle of all against all. That's the devil's values about life. The remaining troops of the Leviathan family were also causing self-destruction, as they were meant to do. In the words of independent people who have no concept of compatriots or colleagues. Fortunately, there was someone with his wits about him who tried to unite the poisonous soldiers who still accounted for the absolute majority. Bite the troops. After retreating, regroup huh. Thomas, the second son of the Leviathan family, was retreating with the remaining troops when he rolled on the ground with an arrow stuck in his neck. The arrow sent by Bianca was followed by Tudor's spear and Sancho's axe. Piggy's enemy. I can never forgive you. I can't let even one go. The fall of the house of Leviathan. Starting with the death of Hobbes de Leviathan, who was like a symbol, the display of extreme poison hermitage rapidly collapsed. The giant poisonous soldiers lost their temper and began to run wild, and the demons also rapidly weakened. Vikir looked down on all this scenery and had a premonition of the end of the long war. He he he. If it weren't for the low taunt that suddenly came from the floor. Where Vikir turned his head, there was Floro's head. Like Andromalius in the past, Floro's was still clinging to life with only his head remaining. But Vikir was not at all alert. The devil kills. Always in a combat posture just before operation. A hunter who is always warmed up. Floro spoke in a humorous tone to Vikir, who was immediately raising his vitality. Calm down. Because you can't kill me anyway. Truly nonsense. There is no need to play with the other person's tongue when you already have everything figured out in the first place. Vikir, who knew that he must be careful of the devil's tongue, especially Floro's tongue, had no reason to stop his sword. However, Floroza's next words were enough to make even a man with steel veins and a furnace heart stop in his tracks. The moment you kill me, the age of destruction will arrive. Among the people gathered here, not a single one truly knew what the age of destruction was. Except for Vikir. Floros continued to flick his black tongue, probably thinking that only Vikir would be the one to talk to. Before going into battle. I twisted the cord of my life, my lifeline, and tied it tightly to the ring of the gate of destruction. When it breaks, the door opens naturally. Devil Dom. Oil World. The gate to polar hell. Vikir clearly remembered the moment the door opened. The coming destruction, the approaching apocalypse, the sum total of all these terrible things, the world of human beings and demons. Do you think you are the only one who laid a trap for the future? In fact, if that is the case, this one is one step above. Cold sweat flows naturally. My hands were also shaking slightly. Floros is a devil whose specialty is deceiving others with lies. Should I believe what he says now? But what if, just in case, this isn't false? What if the door to destruction really opens when you kill him? Even at this very moment when Vikir was worrying, Floros was slowly vaporizing his body. It seemed like he was planning to turn into the red mist of death itself and run away. Didn't I tell you from the beginning? Your efforts are in vain. Floro said with a wide smile. The smile in full bloom was filled with malice that could not be hidden. Tsutsutsutsu. Floro's body gradually becomes lighter. In just a few seconds, he will be completely gone from here. Should I kill him on the spot or let him run away? That was the problem. At a crossroads between two choices that neither side can tolerate. Sarung. Vikir drew his sword. Will you be deceived or will you not be deceived? Now it was time to make a decision. Episode 476, Heaven's Name, The Father is Peerless, 1. A severed head is terrible. Didn't I tell you from the beginning? Your efforts are in vain. 
Currently, it is impossible to kill me. Give up, demon hunter. Floros continued to play with his tongue. Truth or lie? Will you be deceived even though you know it, or will you pretend not to know and force your way through? Camus, standing next to Vakir, gritted his teeth. Hey, is it true what that bastard says? If he dies, will the gates of destruction or something really open? The answer came from two places. One was Seer, shivering on Camus' shoulder, and the other was Decorabia, hanging on Vakir's chest. Because Floros is a being with the ability to lie, we do not know whether what he said is true or not. But it can be said that the possibility is high. Because that guy is cunning. In the end, even demons of the same level cannot know whether Floro's words are false or true. At the moment of choice, faced with a crossroads between options, Bakir hesitated. Are you going to let Floro's go like this, or are you going to kill him at the risk of opening the door to destruction? Even at this moment, Floros was slowly running away, his head turning into vapor. Cold sweat falls like drops of melting lead. Vikir clenched his teeth so hard that they broke. Right then. Do whatever you want. There was a heavy voice coming from behind Vikir. Hugo. He cast a dark shadow behind Vikir's back. Son. He called Vikir. Vikir did not turn around. But Hugo continued to open his mouth. Even if a child makes a wrong choice, it is the father who takes responsibility for it. Vikir thought that was very new. After finishing speaking, Hugo also muttered quietly, saying, It's funny to say that since when did I become a father? At that time. Device Geek. The sound of Baumung scratching the ground was heard. Now, wait. Vikir quickly turned his head, but it was already too late. Flash. Hugo swung his sword. A powerful slash flew in and hit the ground. This was where the head of Floros, who was almost ready to flee, was located. Qua. A tearing scream rang out. A slash without any mercy cut off the devil's last leash. Vikir's mouth was half open as he looked at Floros' head being broken into pieces. The devil kills. Vikir probably would have made the same choice if only a little more time had passed. However, Vikir was deferred from making a choice that carried great responsibility. And that too by the hands of Hugo, whom he had never considered his father. It seemed as if I had unintentionally made a fool of myself. Vikir and Hugo's eyes meet. A gap through which complex thoughts flow. Everyone gathered in that delicate atmosphere was speechless. Right then. Grumble. Quack. Suddenly, a bolt of lightning fell from the dry sky. Dark clouds seemed to be gathering, and a red pillar of light appeared in the sky. It is indeed a huge and huge red line. The red curve, which seemed to be drawn in a round shape, soon began to embroider a complex and geometric pattern in the center. And Vikir recognized at a glance what it was. Gates of destruction. What Floro said before his death was true. He opened the door to destruction by carrying on his body an enormous burden, equivalent to extinction, and made his own life a string to block that door. And now that Floro's lifeline is completely cut, the seal is broken and the door opens as planned. A door summoned by a high-ranking devil at the risk of his life. Perhaps by now, Floro's soul would have suffered a huge penalty beyond extinction and would have been put in a terrible situation where it would have to struggle in pain for eternity that means nothing now. The door to destruction has been opened. Vikir barely suppressed the frantic trembling of his entire body. The monsoon season will soon begin. The long rainy season that signals the end of the world. The final weapon of the demons that caused the greatest and most terrible damage to the human allied forces by annihilating 98% of modern humans. Rain of fire, wind of fire, thunderbolts of fire, flood of fire that fell endlessly. The red raindrops falling all over the world will burn everything. The grass and trees on the mountains will burn, forests will turn into ash deserts, seas and lakes will boil over and turn into wastelands, and all living things will be doomed to burn to death or dry out. The great flood of fire that will overflow over the next 150 days will wipe out all remaining life. Was it real? A portal of this size? There's no comparison with the Naraksu. I've never seen such terrible magic before. 
overwhelming ominousness. I can't believe it. I can't believe something like that existed. It almost feels like the Nouvelle Vague is a cradle. Camus, Ayen, Dolores, Sinclair, and Serco cannot close their mouths when they see the huge portal drawn in the sky above. This is what it means to not believe something even though you are seeing it with your own eyes. Right then. Quack. The entire sky began to shake violently. Vikir shouted like a thunderbolt. The first explosion is coming. Before returning, I clearly remember the moment when the gates of destruction opened. First of all, the moment the door opens, a huge amount of hellfire inside will pour out. That instantaneous firepower is enough to reduce tens of thousands of soldiers to ashes in an instant. The gate of destruction that appeared here now had enough power to do so. Rumbling. The door opens slowly. The crowd was astonished by the heat already radiating out. It's hot. Puss upon my on my head already, but now I feel like I'm completely burning to death, right? Even Orca and Saad had no choice but to give up their fighting spirit against the gate of destruction that appeared in the sky. Thindy Wendy, standing on the watchtower of Tochka Castle, also opened her mouth. If something like that spews fire, the entire Tochka will blow away. Numerous refugees who were eagerly throwing stones from the castle wall were also mesmerized. A natural disaster that no one dares to resist, a being that brings overwhelming despair and fear. That was the gate of destruction. The red portal that opened in the black sky has now taken its full form. And now, its deep, evil intentions are slowly beginning to be revealed. At that time. Geopook. There was someone who took a step forward despite all this despair, confusion, and fear. Vikir. His expression was extremely calm and subdued. Now I know why I regressed. Perhaps it was to prevent this situation. Chang. Vikir drew his sword. And then he took one more powerful step towards the gate of destruction that was opening its mouth towards Tachka. To face the huge firestorm that is about to explode. Yet. Kurrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Since when did you become a father? Hugo. Hugo Les Baskerville. The head of the Baskerville family, the Iron Blood Sword family, was there. Episode 477, Heaven's Name, The Father is Peerless, 2. He will never again have to live such a painful life of being hung by a thick chain during the day and having the rope pulled by him at night. Park Young Hee, Park Young Hee, from The Hunting Dog. Hugo Les Baskerville. The head of the Baskerville family, the Iron Blood Sword family, was there. The body that transformed into a death knight was covered in jet black armor forged with the flames of hell, and the dark red aura was completely changed to black. Lives held as collateral are flowing away like the ebb and flow. The skin changed from white to bluish, and just as the horizons of life and death were reversed, the black and white of the eyes were also reversed. A contract that gives one's life and draws power in return. In the final battle, Hugo's entire body's mana exploded beyond its limit, and he surpassed the threshold of Type 9, which he had only looked at from afar for a long time. Quack 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 quack. The flames spewing out from the Gate of Destruction clash with the aura emanating from a single death knight. Even the world-famous Sword Baomong, which was close to the edge, could not overcome the rebound damage and began to slowly melt. That Baomong. That sharp and sturdy knife. The core was colder and sharper than anything else in the world. Slowly. Hot. It melts. It falls apart. Vikir looked at it and asked without realizing it. Why is that? A voice that slowly and hotly melts like a blade in a furnace. The tone was indeed heavy, but it made even the slightest tremors feel even bigger. Unlike before, this is the first question I asked because I was truly curious and hoping for an answer. Unreasonable paternal love. A false sense of responsibility. A bit of guilt. Belated atonement. What on earth could it be? What made him make the choice he did now? Hugo didn't look back at Bakir's question, which omitted many things. As always, he just silently moves forward while looking straight ahead. Its broad back slowly melted into a blinding halo of light. Suddenly, Bakir felt a very small voice fluttering in his ear, far away and faint. I do not know. Was there something in the world he didn't know? Vikir subconsciously thought that way. And again, I looked at Hugo's back with a dazed and unfamiliar feeling. I've passed several lives, so I'm definitely older than my current father Why? I can't understand him. I still can't figure out what's going on in my mind. The back, which moves away to a distance that cannot be reached, is wide and solid. It soon became black and hazy, as if it was sinking beneath the surface of lava. And soon. Pot. My vision cleared. What is visible is a black sky and a red portal. The primary impact emitted from the gate of destruction was dissipated. The one who blocked it in front of everyone. The iron-blooded swordsman, the supreme ruler of Baskerville and the master of all hunting dogs. And in fact, he himself was a hunting dog who had lived his entire life hanging on a thick chain. Hugo Les Baskerville. Hang me in 64 years old. Burning white and discolored on the battlefield. There was nothing to say other than that it was truly a Baskerville-like end. Even Director Orca and the Marquis de Sade were left speechless by Hugo's struggle and destruction. That is definitely Baskerville Type 9. Was it really possible? I can't believe it. Kane Corso, that old man wasn't senile. Truly overwhelming solemnity and ferocity. Hugo's final spirit made everyone in Tachka grit their teeth with a heavy heart. In the end, Tachka Fortress survived. Vikir too. Vikir looked at the white ash blowing in the wind. White burnt ash. Complete combustion that burned everything. He didn't know if it was something Hugo had left behind, but Vikir somehow thought it was. But. Of course, Hugo's sacrifice did not end the whole situation. Rumbling. The gate of destruction, which Floro summoned at the cost of his life, still remained firmly in the sky. Only the firestorm that occurred when the door was first opened had died down, but the monsoon storm that would follow was still there. Soon, small bright red drops began to fall from inside the huge door. Patter patter patter. It's a spark. They were small sparks, like those that would fly when metal collides with metal. 
They soon began to fall, gradually, in groups, and in countless numbers. It's rain of fire. Someone among the refugees shouted. It was as he said. Countless fire droplets rained down from the sky, fell to the ground, and began to burn the surroundings. No one dared to face this hot shower that fell in a red-hot path. The end. It is clearly casting a deep shadow, starting here at Tochka. Screams started coming from all over the place. Refugees gathered on the wall bowed their heads and fled down the stone wall to avoid the rain of fire. Anything that could burn, such as tents or wooden poles, became prey to the flames. The ground was already forming a red haze. It's over. There's nothing we can do about this. Puss, as expected. I was destined to burn to death. Orca and Saad also looked up at the red raindrops falling and spoke in despair. Right then. Samua, the girl who was standing next to Tudor, wiped the raindrops that fell on her face with her hand. Ah. Uh. There was no pain or despair on the girl's face. There was only surprise and joy. Is this water? Tudor and Bianca turned their heads at the girl's words. This is not water, this is fire. We have to avoid it quickly. Run down the stone wall right now. But Samua still looks confused. No, Sister Appa. This is water. After speaking, Samua wiped the raindrops that fell on her face with her hand and reached forward. Moist bite. It was clearly an ordinary raindrop. What? Huh? What? The people who were fleeing into the castle to avoid the rain of fire raised their heads one by one. Fire droplets pouring down from the gate of destruction. But before I knew it, more and more water droplets were falling through them. Push Sisik. Fire droplets and water droplets meet in the air and turn into white vapor. The red flowers that were blooming from the ground have already begun to wane. Suddenly, the rain falling from the sky began to get heavier. Shut up. It was all water. Be empty. It's really raining. Whoa, water. It's water. Water drops are falling. People looked at the sky with their eyes wide open. Gate of destruction. And the thick dark clouds that lie above it. YNG. A strong wind blowing from the southeast pushes dark clouds this way. Gurgling. The raindrops, which had suddenly turned into heavy rain, were creating strong streams of water down the steep walls of Tachka Fortress. A sudden, crazy downpour of rain. It was also a downpour strong enough to overwhelm the rain of fire falling from the gates of destruction. Camus, Ayen, Dolores, Sinclair, and Serco opened their mouths as they looked at the sudden heavy rain. This is my first time seeing such heavy rain. It has never been like this, even in the jungle where it rains a lot. Oh my god, it couldn't be this timely. The drinking water problem will also be solved. The climate on earth is ever-changing. The rainfall was so heavy that everyone else was speechless. Of all the refugees gathered here in Tachka, I can assure you that not a single one has ever experienced rain of this magnitude. Gurgling. Push sisish sisig. The red-hot gate of destruction began to cool down. The downpour was so heavy that even the monsoon rains were overshadowed. A wave of great flood that sweeps away the fires that have just begun to ignite on the ground. Everyone, return to the fortress. Director Orca gave an order. Tachka is a plateau made of hard rock with no worries about erosion. Since the ground is very high, there is no need to worry about flooding. As the terrain is made up of huge rocks and sand in between, the water drains quickly. A fortress that can withstand any major flood. Avoiding fire and water it's like a mythical arc o. Dolores, who was muttering to herself, suddenly realized something. Fire and water will only avoid this place, and only here will true salvation be achieved. That is a false myth that she created and spread. And the being who had earlier instructed to create that myth. There will be a great flood soon, so prepare the ark. Hold on. All I can say is to hold on. If you wait a little while, everything will be resolved naturally. I can promise you that. A person who has made a home here in Tachka for a very long time. 
Even in a situation where drinking water was running out and demons were running rampant, a person who endured everything alone and waited, and who promised salvation. Vikir. He was standing at the very front of the fortress, looking into the gates of destruction. Pushishishizik. Most of the raindrops evaporated without even reaching the door of destruction, but the raindrops that followed continued to push forward through the heat. The door, which had been heated by Floro's mana, was quickly cooling down due to the enormous downpour. Vikir turned his head. A star can be seen floating in the southeastern sky. Seven stars, commonly called guiding stars. It is a special constellation that is visible only from a specific direction and has been a guide for countless people since ancient times. But now the guiding stars constellation consists of a total of eight stars. Karing. Bikir quietly gazed at the eighth star, shining exceptionally brightly beyond the pouring rain. Poseidon. The joy of rolling and rolling in the new Velvague is finally shining. The monsoon season will unfold in the future. 150 days of showers of fire. And at almost the same time, heavy rain started falling. A 150-day flood. It was essentially a declaration of the end of the war, completely cooling down the furnace that would open the gates of destruction. The gate of destruction grew cold and eventually stopped operating. The wave of mana has dispersed, and the summoning circle that formed the door is also fading. The era of destruction will no longer come. Vikir looked down at the corpses of the Germans who had all been swept away, and at the plain below, which had turned into the sea. And finally, the final command was given. Tudor. Tudor, who received Vikir's call, raises his spear and responds. As if he had been waiting for this moment all along, Vikir immediately opened his mouth. We need Don Quixote's fleet. Everyone who heard that couldn't help but have the same thought. The destination is Imperial Capital. A symbol of the empire where the emperor resides. The center of the world where everyone's youth and prime years have been at least once. And the final enemy, Ilbianzi, a bunch of corpses. The last devil is lurking there. Episode 478, Tachika Annihilation Battle, 6. The eruption of the Nouvelle Vague Volcano. And the trigger that caused it, Poseidon. The small ball that Vikir shot eventually created an enormous butterfly effect. A great flood that sweeps away the whole world. This heavy rain, which will pour for the next 150 days, will engulf all land except some high plateaus. The forest fires that were spreading throughout the empire, the hordes of monsters that took advantage of the evil situation, and the persistent drought were all swept away. Naturally, everyone in Tachka was able to receive salvation. Not only did the current not reach the high plateaus, but the ground made of hard rocks and fine sand was very easy to drain. The fortress was also strong enough to withstand wind and rain, and its only drawback, the lack of drinking water, was naturally solved by collecting rainwater. Under normal circumstances, the Great Flood would have been recorded as an unprecedented supernatural disaster. However, thanks to the great disasters of wildfires, droughts, epidemics, swarms of monsters, and monsoon rains that spread throughout the empire due to the Gate of Destruction, the Great Flood that occurred later became a miracle. Destruction was offset by destruction. Deep drainage ditches were dug throughout the barracks within the fortress. Large barrels were placed in front of the barracks, and the refugees caught rainwater and drank it to their heart's content. I am enjoying to my heart's content the water that I have not been able to drink even a drop of for several days. If the situation outside the castle is like this, the enemy will never attack. Now is the time to focus on internal security. Director Orca released Nouvelle Vague personnel to manage security inside the fortress and reorganized various regulations. Meanwhile, the Marquis de Sade seemed to be already itchy, even though it had been a while since the battle had ended. Puss, I guess we can finally complete the revolution that we couldn't accomplish forty years ago. Where is the crown prince? The emperor has already fallen, so I have to kill that bastard. Oh, grandpa. When my body gets better, let's go together. Sudi barely managed to stop Saad, who wanted to grab a small boat and go to the imperial capital right away. In addition, reorganization after the battle was being carried out step by step. Everyone, led by Osiris and Thindiwendi, joins forces to expand and rebuild Tachka Fortress. 
Everyone was preparing and preparing for when the flood was over in 150 days. Hope that we can move towards the future. Because of that, everyone's expressions were bright. However, there was one person who still maintained a blank expression. Vikir. He always stood at the top of the castle wall, taking in the pouring rain. Slam. The outside of the castle has now turned into the sea. White roses bloom above the wildly undulating waves. Vikir was comparing Tachka before the regression with Tachka now. As it was, the wheel of fate should have turned in an even harsher direction. The present world has become hell due to the invasion of demons. Sudi took advantage of the chaos and led his troops to attack Nouvelle Vague. The Marquis de Sade was able to escape from the Nouvelle Vague thanks to the help of his granddaughter Sudi. Director Orca exploded the Poseidon discovered during work to prevent the Marquis de Sade from escaping. And the monsoon season of Jayafwa ended due to the resulting great flood. However, countless people had already been burned to death, and the unexpected flood dealt a huge blow not only to the devil but also to humanity. But what about now? Although it was quite difficult to secure drinking water due to an error of about a week, the flood began relatively on schedule. The rainy season of apocalypse has cleared, and the gates of destruction have also cooled. At this point, it is nothing short of a complete victory. Isn't that right, human? Dekaravia spoke in a proud tone as if it were his own. But Vikir shook his head quietly. We have not won yet. We just won a big local battle, and the final battle remains. Are you talking about the first hour? Yes. Vikir nodded, looking at the outside world that had turned into a vast sea. Dekaravia opened his eyes wide and admired. Indeed. So, as soon as I escaped from prison in the Nouvelle Vague, Don Quixote, the Chang He Chang family, was the first to be restored. In order to obtain the invincible armada that divides the power of the Don Quixote family along with the invincible cavalry. Yes. In a world like this, only those who have a fleet can reign as losers. Decarabia paused for a moment at Vikir's words. Then, after some thought, he spoke again. I thought of you when you said loser, human. What? This is Floros, whom I dealt with before. Decarabia continued speaking with a slightly uneasy look. Floros was one of the losers who was famous for his lies and persistent life even in hell. What do you want to say? Is he really immortal? I doubt that. If he faked his own death. Floros is so good at lying that even his death is suspicious. However. No need to worry any more about that matter. What? Why is that so? Whether he was alive or dead at that moment. Because in the end, he won't survive. Bakir smiled dryly as he looked at the raging storm and waves, and the distant tributaries of the Red and Black Mountains beyond them. This world too. If you know it, it's a place as dangerous as hell. A jungle with heavy rain pouring down continuously. There was a man running through a forest filled with blade-sharp leaves. Ha! Huh. OMG! Wow! The person running with his entire body covered in blood was clearly Thomas de Leviathan, the second son of the poisonous hermit Leviathan. However, the red aura of death rising from his body and his sharpened teeth clearly meant that he was not what he used to be. Floros. Just before his death, he performed a trick to transfer Thomas's soul and take away Thomas's dying body. In the first place, all demons were merely demon hosts, spare bodies that could be replaced at any time, so it was not such a strange situation. Floros, who took Thomas's body at the last moment, desperately fled from the battlefield with his already battered body, and eventually succeeded in coming here. My body is falling apart I can't last much longer shit forcibly opening the door of destruction even my soul is in tatters hurry up and go to the imperial capital I have to ask Ilban for help. Still, since he succeeded in killing Piggy, there may be elements of negotiation. Floros thought so. Right then. SS. Floros felt his whole body go cold. Starting from the rocky valley we had just entered, the temperature around us was rapidly dropping. Cold bone. A place name called by the indigenous people living in the waters of the Red and Black Mountains. There is no way for Floros to know about the climate here, where frost freezes even in the middle of summer. 
As my already low body temperature dropped even further, my body became sluggish and my joints became stiff. More and more blood was flowing from holes in the neck and stomach, and from open wounds all over the body. Right then. Hee hee. As soon as Floros came out of the rocky valley, he had to lie face down. SS. A huge shadow is cast through the raindrops and leaves. What appeared along with an eerie sound was a spider with a huge body. The spider was searching the forest as if looking for something. There were more than one or two such spiders far beyond the forest. Am I looking for myself? Floros had a hunch. If you are discovered by those spiders, you will die. There is no room for eternal destruction. Floros desperately held his breath and crawled on the floor. Avoiding the spider's gaze, I crawled on the floor like a bug. How much time had passed, Floros was able to avoid the spider's siege and arrive at the riverside. Although it was a river located at a fairly high altitude, the river stream seemed to have swelled significantly due to continued heavy rain. With a plop. The moment Floros dips into the water to cross the river. Quasic. At that moment, Floros felt a sharp pain hit his lower body and had to freak out. Ugh. Something like a fish. Fish with saw-like teeth were clinging to Floros and biting his flesh. Natory. Even from the surface of the water, the man-eating fish that live in the rivers of the Red and Black Mountains could be seen gathering in droves when they smelled blood. Shit. The moment Floros turns around to come out of the river. Hissing. I see black darkness filling my vision. A huge maw was holding Floros' head up to swallow it. Monsieur Hushu. A huge snake that lives in the sea. This snake approached backwards without making any sound and swallowed Floros in the blink of an eye. Cool. This insignificant little thing. Floros used his last strength to burst the snake's belly skin. Fortunately, it was not that difficult to kill since it was a subadult that had not yet fully grown. However, most of the vitality needed for escape was used to tear the tough snake skin, so it was only a failure. I need to find a place to rest. Otherwise, I will be a guest. What kind of disgrace is this? Floros desperately opened his eyes that kept closing. When I ripped off my eyelids and left only the eyeballs, my vision became clear again. Eventually, Floros discovered a deep tunnel dug under the roots of a tree. I felt like I could avoid the rain and preserve my body temperature there. Floros walked towards the tunnel with unsteady steps. But could it be that his concentration was disrupted due to his low stamina? Floros did not notice the large claw marks on the side of his tree. And the results were terrible. K wo wo. A thunderous roar erupted from behind. Floros didn't even have time to turn around. A front paw swung by a blind old female ox bear with a destructive force equivalent to a weight of over a dozen tons. It shattered Floro's skull. Wow. Shoo. Ox bear looked like he was disgusted by Floros, who was spewing out poisonous blood from all over his body. Soon, the ox bear washed the blood off its front paws with rainwater and went into the den. It means it's not worth killing. Floros crawled on the floor. No words come out properly from the crushed mouth. What do you want to say? A cry for a sick and painful body? Hatred towards those who made him like this? The anger that comes from recognizing the miserable reality? The revenge that you promised again and again while coming here? Or not fear of extinction? Do you regret that you should never have come here in the first place? Complex thoughts are mixed in the muddy brain. And. There were people who welcomed Floros like that. Wow. 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 Mosquito. An incredibly large number of mosquitoes follow the scent of blood. There were mosquitoes that clung to the body of Floros, or rather Thomas, and sucked blood. Unusually, there were also flesh-sucking mosquitoes. There were also mosquitoes that only suck skin. Mosquitoes were also seen sticking their needles deeper and sucking on bones. And among them was a mosquito that did not suck anything. It just floats in the air with hazy, murky eyes. A mosquito that doesn't suck anything, but somehow reigns supreme over other mosquitoes and exudes an overwhelming ominousness. And Floros, who was lying on the floor and groaning, opened his bloodshot eyes at the mosquito. 
Soon, the mosquito quietly landed on Floro's head. Then, he stabbed the needle into empty space, but with a clear target in mind. Juk. The red-hot smoke enters the stomach through the mosquito's saliva. Mosquitoes are the most feared and wary of natives living in flood waters. Soul-sucking mosquitoes decorated Floro's horse. It was a truly shabby and miserable end, reduced to nothing more than a meal. Episode 479, Urban Sea Battle, 1. Shudda. The rain is pouring down in torrents. The world that had turned into a sea was rippling more and more violently. The people gathered at Tachka gradually show signs of anxiety. Aren't we going to be trapped here and starve to death? What, there is so much food piled up. You still have plenty. But what if this great flood continues? They say it only lasts 150 days. It's okay because we have enough food and more drinking water. But it's already the sea outside. And seriously, how do you know if the flood will stop in 150 days? I heard that the eldest son of the Don Quixote family has gone to pick up the fleet. That's why everyone is waiting now. The rumors circulating among refugees were not empty. In fact, Tachka, a highland area, is the safest fortress in the world, but at the same time it is a completely isolated place that is no different from an uninhabited island. Is that why? Vikir was staring endlessly at the distant sea again today. Slam! Waves that reached the sturdy walls of the castle on a high plateau. The white foam blooming as the water broke white looked like a flower garden. Vikir was sitting on the wall in the pouring rain. As if cooling hot quenched iron, you are hitting your body with cold rainwater. At that time. Is it raining today too? Chong Sung Sung Maji. There was a voice coming from behind Vikir. Kamu. She also walked next to Vikir in the rain. It's really pouring down a ton. Kamu said as he looked at the water flowing down the castle wall like a waterfall. If it weren't for the sea of fire created by the devils, this would have been a disaster. The two disasters intertwined exquisitely, reducing the damage. Is this also what you calculated in Nouvelle Vague? Before we erupt the volcano. For the most part. Vikir nodded quietly. The calculation wasn't perfect, but it was roughly correct. But if the margin of error had been a little wider, something really big would have happened. Vikir and Camus were looking in the same direction. The two didn't say anything for a while. In the end, it was Camus who spoke first. I'm sorry about what happened to your father. Vikir, who had been standing motionless until now, responded to those words. At best, my shoulders were only slightly shaking. The memories of that day are still clear in my ears. Why is that? I do not know. Memories that crumble white. White burnt ashes. Now scattered in the rain. Hugo, who died fiercely, was a hero to everyone in Tachka that day. However, Bikir has no choice but to regard Hugo as an object of complicated feelings. He. Bikir opened his mouth after a long silence. I don't know how he crossed the threshold of Type 9. Compared to my previous life, the result was quite different. Camus hesitates for a moment at Bikir's words. Actually. He came to see me a long time ago. Camus' testimony was quite surprising to Vikir. It was not long after the trial in Nakajanai ended. He wanted to discuss it with me. A way to get you out of prison. Ah. By the way, Suddy, it looks like she was holding that woman's hand at that time too. The fact that Suddy and Hugo had joined hands was a bit surprising even to Vikir. For Vikir, Hugo seems to have prepared more things than expected. The process of Thindiwendi finding Suddy, who had disappeared, the process by which Ian was able to go to Nouvelle Vague to avoid summary execution, and the process by which Suddy created a false identity and was able to pass through the gates of Nouvelle Vague. It was all thanks to the help that had been spread out in secret. Vikir remembered the image of Hugo he had seen at the trial. The Baskerville family's argument is as follows. Although the crimes are serious and vicious, including charges of treason, parricide, and poisoning of the family head, the defendant deserves to be treated like a nobleman as he is an inheritor of the blood of the Baskerville family. Therefore, we request a ruling that takes this into account. 
the back of Hugo, who was just sitting back in his wheelchair without raising any objection. Vikir is speechless. Camus continued talking about that time. While we were talking about helping you escape from prison, the topic of the wraith tree came up. I had no choice but to mention the grave of the stabbed. Camus raised his hand. Tsutsutsutsutsutsu. The revenant tree waves its long, bare branches sky and sky. I was surprised at how the revenant tree reacted to Hugo. It looks like he read a certain memory from the wraith tree. At Camus' words, Bakir nodded quietly. Because there was definitely something to point out. Even after stepping into the realm of supremacy, only those who continue to run without resting with the same mindset as when they first picked up the sword will gain something. This is an area that denies all common human understanding, empathy, understanding, faith, common sense, probability, and causality. A being who has not experienced death can never set foot here. You probably won't be able to reach this level in your lifetime. This is because the realm of Type 9 is beyond the threshold of death. A true Baskerville will come here at the end of its life. We will see each other again someday. What Hugo saw was probably the appearance of a cane corso. What did he feel from his older brother's words? Vikir thought once again. Meat eating, six forms. A state that can only be reached by transcending all emotions. Chilsik, seven postures. A state that can be reached only by regaining the feelings that have been abandoned. Eight types, eight postures. Just like the time when I first picked up the sword, I have to go through countless brutal battles to reach a point where I can reach it. Old style, nine postures. An incomprehensible zone at the core of the highest realms that only those who have experienced death can ascend to. With what mindset did Hugo cross that threshold? At the entrance to the other shore of life and death, Bakir thought and thought. At that time. Widely. Camus put his hand on Bakir's shoulder. Don't try to handle everything on your own. You've come this far, so think about the people who are thinking of you. That's right. And there was a voice that agreed with Camus' words. Dolores. She suddenly appeared in front of her castle wall and said to Bakir as she put her umbrella over him. Everyone gathered here follows Vikir. These are the people who are ready to follow wherever Vikir goes, right? That's true, but don't I have an umbrella? It's for two people. Dolores, ignoring Camus grumbling, continued speaking to Vikir. Don't worry Tudor. He's a strong friend, so he'll definitely come back with a fleet. At her words, Vikir turned his head towards the sea again. Looking at the fierce storm and the high waves, it seems that no strong fleet can set sail. Now that we had won, the hour was urgent, but it was a very frustrating and hopeless situation. I am always watching from the watchtower, so you should stop going in. You can't do it even if it hurts your health. Ayan suddenly appeared and spoke to Vakir. Her superhuman eyesight, which allows her to see several kilometers away, far exceeds that of Vakir, and if Tudor comes with a fleet, she will be the first to see it. What, Savage? Why do you keep acting like a stranger to other men? Savage? Do you want to get ripped off again? Oh, it reminds me of the old days. Do you know if that's still possible? Camus of the Morgue and Ien of Valak had never been on good terms. At that time. You guys stop fighting. My brother, I'm already in a state of trouble. Sinclair appeared after completing repair work on the castle wall. Camus and Ayen narrowed their eyes, but Sinclair looked away. She said as she placed a cup of warm tea in front of Vakir. The next battle will be the final battle. How about calming your mind with a cup of tea? Are you going to the Imperial Castle? I have only encountered it in literature. Next to Sinclair was Serko, who was in charge of security. Kirko asked Vakir. But does the fact that the earth is like this mean that all the people living in the lowlands have died? We gathered as many people as possible to Tachka to prevent that from happening. And those who could not come here due to time and space were also evacuated to other highlands in advance. I think I did the best I could. Sinclair answered instead. It seems that the two continue to have this conversation on the way here. Right then. Ha. Huh. Ayan who had been fighting with Camus next to Vakir, jumped up. She has good eyesight, 
and she seems to have seen something beyond the swirling waves through the darkness and the storm. Finally, Ian shouted loudly. Come. Fleet. It was as she said. Soon, a huge ship began to approach through strong waves and storms. The large and heavy ship was approaching the highlands of Tachka, ignoring any waves. The number of such ships is enormous. It is truly an enormous feat. Dolores also shouted with joy. It's a tutor. The tutors are back. As she said, a flag symbolizing Don Quixote was fluttering on top of the captain's ship in front. Even at first glance, there were a lot of people on board the ship. It's true. Tachka was not flooded. Is there really food there? Ah, there really is salvation. There was land that wasn't flooded. You should have believed what those who walked in the night said. If it had been like that a long time ago. There were also an incredibly large number of refugees aboard the enormous number of ships. And at the stern of the captain's ship in front, two familiar faces appeared. It was Tudor and Bianca. Vikir. Sorry for being later than promised. No shame. We're late because this idiot was passing by and said we had to save all the people stranded in the highlands. The two were still bickering and fighting even in this emotional moment. Camus, Ian, Dolores, Sinclair, and Serco looked concerned as they saw the numerous other refugees coming to Tachka. If we accept more of them, won't our food supply decrease? Hmm, new security problems may arise. Are you okay? They said there was enough food. Security is also at a manageable level because the Nouvelle Vague team joined us. You can tolerate it for about five months. We poured all of our family's assets into it. It's good to pursue justice, but nothing should get in the way of the final battle. Right then. Does not matter. I have to leave here soon anyway. Vikir finally stood up. Now it's the final battle. Then everyone's expressions hardened. They also understood Vikir's words. A one-shot match that will soon take place in the imperial capital. The final hour is approaching. The number and types of ships Tudor led were enormous. A longship with a small hull and shallow draft that allows for small-scale, quick maneuvering, the Carvey, which has 13 rows of oars and can carry 26 oarsmen, the Sneka, which has 20 rows of oars and can carry 40 oarsmen, and 100 combatants. Skade, which can accommodate, Draka, which can carry over 1,000 combatants, etc. Moreover, the people who drive these numerous ships are veterans of the Don Quixote family who know how to freely navigate the vast sea. Not only did they possess tremendous navigational skills as they navigated the North Sea, where drift ice was floating, but they also had the courage and courage to rush to the center of the empire, which became the sea. Clap. Clap. Numerous ships cut through the rough sea. A death squad joined by the Baskervilles, the Morgue, the Quo Vadis, the Bourgeois, and even the survivors of the Don Quixote and Usher families. Moreover, characters from Colossio Academy, the Miskara Women's College, Varangian Training Center, and Tower of Magic all gathered in one place. Prominent figures such as Osiris, the Seven Counts, Les Payne, Adolf, Pope Nobukov I, Cardinal Luther, Archbishop Moscus, Damien, and Headmaster Banshee were all standing at the forefront. And in addition, everyone who has been in a relationship so far gathers in one place and fires up their will to fight. The Allied forces of Tachka went to the Imperial capital aboard Don Quixote's ship. Going inward, further inward, tracing the map of the ecliptic, which has now been transformed into a sea chart. Meanwhile, Vikir, who was on the leading captain's ship, was standing at the stern, looking out at the endless horizon. Kielgruk. Every time the ship shakes from side to side, the sound of the chains wrapped around Vikir's hands scraping on the deck can be heard. Next to Vikir, Minipin and Chihuahua were looking worried. Oh my! Subconsul. Over there. Vikir turned his gaze in the direction the Chihuahua was pointing with his finger. A huge shadow spread across the water next to the ship. A huge sea monster whose identity cannot be guessed is seen passing under the water. Naturally, this is a species that would not live here. I can see how the ecliptic will change. Where the emperor lives. No, now this is where the crown prince lives. 
I have a rough idea of what the submerged place would look like by now. The opponent who will make the final negotiation in the imperial capital, the center of the empire, is Ilbianzi. The first protagonist who led the era of destruction. And it is also the destination of several lives that Bakir has crossed over. The revenge of the comrades who died first was slowly coming to an end. Waiying. A strong sea breeze blew and inflated the sails. The boat began to run as if flying on the waves. Kielgruk. The sound of chains scraping against the deck again. Vikir tightened his grip on the chain in his hand. Then Minfin next to me turned his gaze towards the end of the chain and stammered a question. Well, but Vice Consul. I've been curious about this for a while, what is that? I didn't ask the question because I didn't know what was really tied to the end of the chain. It's a coffin. What Vikir was carrying was a large and heavy coffin. You don't know who's inside. Episode 480, Urban Naval Battle, 2. Don Quixote's Invincible Armada. When it comes to naval warfare, it is a military unit that boasts the strongest military power of the empire. There was thick darkness ahead of the numerous ships moving through the blue waters of the Changhe. Vikir, the bow of the boat running at the forefront, was lost in thought as he faced the strong sea breeze. Infinite darkness covers the world. This was definitely one of Ilbianzi's abilities. The ecliptic sky, which is always clear, now shows neither moonlight nor starlight. But. Quack. Slam. There are only tsunami waves of enormous height that keep coming. Is this going to cause the boat to capsize? Bianca said as if she was worried. But Tudor, standing next to her, just snorted. Don Quixote's ship capsized by just this much of a tsunami. No way. It was literally like that. True to its name, the Invincible Armada advanced through the tsunami without a single ship running aground. The huge ships were connected to each other with thick chains, so the whole was like one, and each was like the whole. Yonhuangyi, Chain Plan A tactic of connecting ships with chains. Thanks to this strategy suggested by Vakir, the Invincible Armada's breakthrough power was greatly doubled. Camus, who saw it, nodded and admired it. It's a good method as long as you watch out for fire attacks. There is no need to worry about being attacked by fire even though the rain is pouring down like this. That's right. It's the best method available at this point. He's my boyfriend after all. Camus grinned at Vakir's answer and tapped Vakir's arm. Right then. As soon as Camus got closer, Vakir's expression changed. Smell. Camus was greatly embarrassed by Vakir's unexpected remark. She hurriedly smelled the scent coming from her body. W what is it? What? Do I smell? Do you wash every day? Hey, I just finished brushing my teeth. I'm meeting my boyfriend, but I don't know oh, or should I have at least sprayed some perfume? I was already worried because it didn't seem like it would be a good idea to carry perfume into the battlefield hey, maybe I was sweating when I did gymnastics in the morning. Not that smell. Vikir dismissed Camus' words, his face turning red as if it were about to explode. The smell of the devil. Half a unique, faint smell. Then Camus' expression hardened. That's strange. Right now, seer only accounts for a very small amount of my body, so it shouldn't smell that much, right? It doesn't come from you. Vikir answered in a low voice. In the past, when Camus was working as the corpse queen, she shared half of her body with Seer VIII. At that time, Bakir had already smelled the half-demon scent of Camus once and imprinted it on his nose. And right now. A smell similar to that time was being carried by the sea breeze. Right in front, in the direction of the imperial palace, which is considered a key area in the imperial capital, the center of the empire. Camus too could soon smell what Bakir was talking about. Indeed, this smell, clearly felt even from afar, was thick and strong. It's a strange smell. It's not your typical devil's thing. Ian, who was on top of the watchtower, jumped down and said. Having spent an intense time in the Maw Tree, she was able to smell this type of scent in the process of killing countless demons, monsters, and fairies. Surely I feel a slightly different energy than before. It's a lot more ominous, but it feels just as unstable. 
different from the level of strength. Dolores, who came out of the cabin below deck, also had a serious expression on her face. It feels similar to when I was with Camus, but it's also a little different. When I was with Camus, I felt like I was half human and half demon, I guess this feeling is just like half of the devil remaining. Sinclair, who was organizing the anchor rope, also agreed with everyone's opinion. After being covered in the blood of the dragon demon in the maw tree, she too seemed to have gained some sense of her own. Buzz buzz. Bakir heard the cries of Beelzebub, who was sleeping inside his wrist. And the exact same cries were coming from behind deck. Kirko. As she was staring at Bakir in silence, the demonic sword Asmodeus was emitting a Beelzebub-like cry from around her waist. Bakir asked Decarabia, who was hanging on his chest. Do you know anything about Ilbianzi? Am I a knowledge vending machine? Don't treat me like that saint over there. Dolores, who was next to him, became angry at Decarabia's words, but was stopped by Camus and Ian's dissuasion. Calm down. It's not wrong. Ha, huh, during the Battle of Tachika, it was actually a holy water vending machine. You, that's too much. You worked hard to protect yourself from behind. This is why healers lose money. If you do well, it won't be noticeable, but if you don't, it will be noticeable. Calm down. If it weren't for you, Tachika would have fallen a long time ago. Right. Holy power was a miraculous power. It's my first time seeing this. Dolores, Sinclair, and Serco also said something. But in the meantime, Bakir was only focused on Decarabia's answer. Wow. It's the first hour. The body structure is heterogeneous. Ordinary living creatures tend to divide individuals based on their bodies, but that concept does not apply to him. What does that mean? Therefore, aren't you going to divide and determine human beings based on yourself? There is only one person called you. And if there is a human that satisfies the same criteria, two. Another three. Four. Five. But it is not the first hour. Two can be one, and one can be two. According to common sense, foundation is impossible because the standard for dividing self from non-self is outside the human concept. I have no idea what you're talking about. So, I guess it means he has a unique body structure like you. Decarabia is a thing-type demon that falls into a fairly unique category among demons. In that case, Ilbianzi could also be difficult to deal with. Anyway. I don't know much either. Ilbunsi is someone with a lot of secrets. But. Decarabia lowered his voice as if he was revealing a very important secret. I only heard that the roles of those who close the door, and those who open the door, are separate. This is all I know. Bikir frowned at the Zen question that became more confusing the more he heard it. Having lived an upright and upright life his whole life, he doesn't really like this kind of round-the-clock conversation. Just when Vakir was about to ask another question. Emergency. There's a tsunami ahead. I heard Thindy Wendy shouting from the watchtower of the ship next to me. Everyone quickly grabbed hold of the railing and fixed their gaze towards the front. Kuo. A wave of water rising with tremendous force. It seemed like a black hill was rising, and then waves rose so high that I thought they might reach the sky. It felt like watching the entire skin of the sea surface peel off. Mmm. Tudor also looked quite nervous. Even the strongest fleet could be in danger in the face of a tsunami of that magnitude. However. Puss, what are you so worried about? The Marquis de Sade, who was sitting in front of the bow and holding a fishing rod, looked completely carefree. He tilted his head crookedly and asked Don Quixote's knights, including Tudor. Have you forgotten who you are with now? Everyone tilted their heads. Right at that moment. Qua boom. There seemed to be a tremendous roar coming from the front, and the tsunami in front of me was torn apart in an instant. A tsunami that collapses helplessly, leaving a gaping hole. And everyone on board saw. The moment the tsunami rises to attack the fleet, a hand grabs the back of the tsunami with tremendous force and pulls it down. Puff. Soon, the hand holding the line of the fishing rod that the Marquis de Sade was holding popped out of the water. 
The person who landed on the deck of the ship was a killer whale with white spots on its black skin. Sometimes you have to relieve yourself like this. Orca, who took the form of a killer whale type beast man, said as he put a damp cigarette on the cigarette that Lieutenant Colonel Bastille had given him. Puff puff puff. The heads of each family were in charge of disposing of the fragments of the tsunami that Orca destroyed in the water. Even though they were fragments, each and every piece of water was of considerable size and was flying in all directions. Chin. The person perched on the railing in front of Akir, with his black hair flowing, is the strange bird Osiris. He, who had just destroyed a huge tsunami, suddenly felt Bakir's gaze and turned his head. If he is an older brother, is it because he is an older brother? Osiris immediately read the emotions in Bakir's eyes. Are you worried about your father's business? Bakir didn't bother to answer. And Osiris didn't bother to ask either. However, Osiris turned around and added. I also couldn't understand my father's actions. But I sympathized. I can't understand it, but I can sympathize with it. Although there are cases of the opposite, these cases are extremely rare. Osiris turned his head. His gaze was focused on Thindy Wendy on the lookout of the next ship. Maybe someday you'll understand. Osiris left a muttering, it's not necessary to understand, and disappeared as suddenly as he had appeared. Vikir was lost in thought. The women who are following him, the father who has turned white, the cold gate of destruction, and the final negotiation with the last Sipsanchi. My stomach is shaking violently and my heart is also pounding. Vikir took a deep breath. The boat may be rocked, but the mind must not be rocked. This is especially true at important moments like now. Vikir shook his head to shake off any random thoughts. There is no need to think too far about the future. Only one. The devil kills. All we need to do is go all in on the head to head match against number one city, which is just around the corner. Yet, there was something visible in the center of the world, which at first glance seemed to be a vast chaos, with the blackened sky and water. I saw a pointed building rising into the horizon. Serko shouted while standing on the railing. Is that the central clock tower? I've seen it in books. The symbol of the ecliptic, which overshadowed the passage of time, was seen standing tall, showing off its unchanging majesty. The center of a big city where everything, including the Colosseo Academy, was submerged in water. A fleet advancing over a city that was once a symbol of prosperity and fashion. It was a full-fledged yet somewhat bitter entry into the imperial capital.